when other people tell their history, they come across as being patriotic. When other people talk about where they came from and who they are and what their history is, that's, seen, that's called patriotism. But when African Americans do it or when black people do it, they're labeled as being militant. They're called rebels. They're called Afrocentric. So that's the big difference. Our history, for some reason, it becomes offensive to people. So we have to stop being afraid to tell what our true history is. The studies will show that the dominant population here in America, especially, and in Europe, have wanted to claim everything for themselves. And so they have made up a lot of stories as they traveled to places. And as we know, all of the places that the so-called European or the white explorers traveled, when they got there, black people were already there. Some kind of black people, or yellow people, or red people, or brown people. You, as a black man, are the root of all of the civilizations. Every body they've ever found, every tomb they've ever raided, whatever it was, they found uh, something symbolic of the black man, either our features, your nose, your mouth, your head, the way we looked, our hair, even braids, everything. The makeup of a human being's self-esteem, self-image, and self-concept is not only based upon one's family history, but it's also based upon one's racial history. So when you look at the self-esteem of black people and black children, you can rest assured that at least 50% of how high or how low it is, is contingent upon positive information that they know or don't know about who they have been in racial history. And over the last, I would say, thousand years, there has been an, a protracted uh, effort and an ongoing effort by those in power, the European powers especially, to make sure that what we have done as an indigenous or what we call autochthonous peoples, Earth's autochthonous peoples, uh, is erased irrevocably from the minds of all our people. Only a people who haven't learned how to respect themselves will let someone suggest or suggest themselves that they forget about their history. If you know yourself, there's no way that anybody could ever uh, do the things to you or would you do the things to you and yours that we find ourselves doing. So that, and in, in many ways, I don't really think it's hidden. It's there. It's just that they're not allowing us to understand. According to Dr. Ben, the original name of Africa was Alkebalon. Africa, the whole continent, was also called Ethiopia. As a matter of fact, the Atlantic Ocean was called the Ethiopian Sea. So there were several different names. Africa was really described by different tribes. It wasn't a whole monolithic society. But eventually, they named Africa after a European. Africa was not called Africa. It's actually named after the one who actually conquered uh, the uh, Carthaginian, Scipio Africanus. So they usually, the Roman, uh, Roman uh, types of system is that the conquering general gets to name the region he conquered. He gets his name to be placed on that region. So Scipio Africanus, is, is they, you know, they, they named a certain terrain after him. So everybody should say, well, let's call it Africa or Africanus. But if you look to uh, Dr. Ben's work, you'll find that it was called Kush, and you'll find it was called Alkibulan, it had many names, Ethiopia, which Ethiop, which is essentially Greek, but a whole continent was once known as Ethiopia. It's terrible, you know, about just where math came from. You know, all of the pictures that they've shown out of Africa, they've never really educated the Americans, white or black, about what really goes on in Africa, what some of the cities are really like. And that we're not running around over there with Tarzan, you know, and when they show anything from Africa, even down to today, they pick the worst scenes, the most terrible situations, you know, and uh, they show those, but uh, we have a proud history. But of course, what we did in Egypt 5,000 years ago, or what we did in China 35,000 years ago, is of no benefit if we don't understand what to do today and how that would help us to survive. And we discovered the clock. We did discover the wheel. We were, black man has never been a caveman. You've never been in the cave. There's no history of it. You've ever been in a cave. Uh, 
we discovered mathematics and uh, the alphabet and writing and all of those great things that they have built a foundation on that they came and got and took back to other countries. We don't know what Africa would be like without the white influence. We don't know what it would be like without the Rockefellers and De Beers and all of them. We don't know what Africa would have been like. We do know that there were greater places in Africa other than Egypt, which is the only one they let us know about. Concurrently and simultaneously during the Pyramid Age, there are great things happening in West Africa, but we very seldom. There are nations known as Dartichet. Dartichet is now, would geographically presently be located where Ghana is. We had the Nak culture, which is where we today would call Nigeria. We have the Monomotapan Empire in what today we call Zimbabwe. There, there are over 300 stone structures in Southern Africa. And then you have that great structure in, in the great Zimbabwe that shows a direct relationship to the Grand Lodge of Luxor in Egypt. You have Puani, which is in today's Somalia, Ethiopia. You have the, the Kush empires that are simultaneously happening. When Hatshepsut, the great Pharaoh king, although she was a woman, she was a Pharaoh king, sitting on the throne of Kemet, her cousin sits on the throne of Puani, or what we call Somalia. There are great things happening historically across the African continent. You have the kingdoms of Cuba and Luba in Central Africa. Mansa Musa was the king of Mali in the, the 1300s, very wealthy brother. During the dark age of Europe, Europe was going through a dark age, Africa was thriving. It was the gold capital. Mansa Musa was considered the wealthiest man on the planet at the time. Mansa Musa had a very well-known pilgrimage to Mecca where he went to, to Egypt and went to Mecca and went through Egypt and he gave out so much gold it threw off the Egyptian economy. In today's terms, Mansa Musa gave away what would be the equivalent of a hundred million dollars in gold. The African was the first race to circumnavigate the entire globe. All over Africa, all over the world, the peoples of color that they call Africans, Alcubilanians, we were all over the world. So to say that the, the, the Ghana, the, in Ghana, they had the Ashanti, uh, they had, I mean, all over, we had powerful um, uh, dynasties, so innumerable we couldn't even name them. Because remember, we had hundreds of thousands of years, and that's the secret. They cut us off at 6,000 because anything beyond that they could say is mystery, they could say is myth. So when you control the information, which is essentially what they've learned to do, under the Vatican they have about six to eight miles of storage space that have all of our artifacts and uh, the Virgin Mother being black, all of the faces. We have to take apart the layers that are uh, actually uh, constructed in the lie. They're layered. For instance, you have a discipline in academia called Egyptology. Now, what is Egyptology? They say, well, it's the study of Egypt. Well, no, it's not the study of Egypt. Egyptology was created by the Vatican in order to make sure that there was a screening mechanism in place to explain away the truth that was being excavated every year that kept giving them proof of who the ancient Chemites were. So Egyptology and Egyptologists are essentially agents of disinformation. Where else do you see a society, a people, and a way of life actually become a science? Unless you have specific purposes to make sure that the information that you are gathering on those people are given the proper perspectives to maintain the lie. So you don't get an Americology, you don't get Europology, you don't get Russiaology. Richard Pryor, right? When he had his special back in 1977, there's a scene. They only allowed him to do five shows. In fact, they were rather ignorant because it took him five shows to realize what the brother was really doing. Richard Pryor, there's a scene where he goes in uh, to the pyramids and he is carrying the bags of the archaeologists and the anthropologists who are of European descent. And they're talking amongst themselves about what this find is and its importance, the greatness of it. And Richard Pryor is in the, this temple uh, looking all around and he begins to say, but all 
all these people are black. He said, look at that guy over there, that guy look like my uncle. And he's just, you know, I mean, it's humorous, but what Richard Pryor is actually talking about is that, you know, these are black people in these pyramids, and these are the people that built these pyramids. He said, wait a minute, these people, and then all of a sudden, the, the camera begins to show the anthropologists of European descent, and they start to nudge each other because they realize, hey, you know, the guy carrying the bags is looking around and he's learning some things in here. So very quietly, you see them backing out of the pyramid. Right? And Richard Pryor is still there talking about how great the pyramid is. And then all of a sudden, you, they show you the door close and all of a sudden the scene goes black. Mm -hmm. Which means that was the blackout on the information for black folk to understand their history. This is what Richard Pryor was dropping on us in 1977. This is what actually has happened. Richard was telling us, this is what has happened to us. Because as, as you become conscious and brother becomes conscious and as a community we become conscious, the Europeans who know this, are beginning to realize. So they're trying to shut the door on us. African people established the first dynasties in Asia. Um, you, when you look at old paintings of um, Eastern Asian people, you can see the, the African ancestry in, the, in their features. The Japanese were formed when Ethiopians brought South Koreans onto the island and combined with the original people there known as the Ainu. The Ainu now, you're gonna find the Ainu in the Philippines. They're gonna be called Negritos. You're gonna find them in Vietnam. They're called the Champa or the Mountain Yards. You're gonna find African people throughout the Far East. Very dark complexion, very curly hair, wide nose, thick lip. You will also find those with straight hair. You will find those with a more aquiline nose. Some of the first Buddha statues clearly had African features, classical African features. If you go to Thailand, if you go to Korea, if you go to Vietnam, you will see some of these statues up that has, has the classical African nose, classical African lips, woolly hair. When we go to Asia, we see that the founder of the Samurai Warrior, okay, in Japan, all right, was an African. We found that the uh, founders of the ninja system was an African. In fact, in Japan, there's a saying that if you don't have a little bit of African blood, you can never truly be a samurai. Martial arts was established by a black Dravidian who was living in southern India by the name of Bodaharma. The Bodaharma, it was said that he walked from southern India into to Asia, China, and on his way there, he would study the fighting mechanisms of animals and he used that as a form of self-defense for himself, and that's where martial arts started. There was another guy named Tiguai, who was a, an original master of martial arts, and if you look at old paintings of Tiguai, this dude looks like Lionel Richie. So martial arts was really established in Africa. Even during slavery in Brazil, there's a form of Brazilian martial arts, which is African martial arts called capoeira. And what they would do, the, the African slaves would practice this form of martial art and they would disguise it as dancing. When we look at the early pictures of most of the deities of Asia, nearly all of them bore striking resemblance to the deity, deities of the now Bali civilizations. And even in their writings, you will see that even in Asia, not just Greece and Rome, but even in Asia, you see them paying tribute paying tribute to the spiritual systems and history that they had learned in Africa. In fact, the Asian spiritual system is probably the closest approximate to the traditional African spiritual system. From the one, you get many, with the creator being manifested in all living organisms, be it a tree or a human being. That is fundamental to Asian thought, but it's also fundamental to African thought, which predated Asia. When you go into these jungles in Bangkok and the areas of Vietnam, when uh, the Vietnamese, when they were fighting in Vietnam, they went into these temples, they saw nothing but these African faces. When they saw the black man dressed up like that, they thought that the, the Buddha gods had come back. All these black men dressed in these American uh, uh, faces, they were accustomed in the bush to these black faces, these black Buddhas. And when you go deeper into that information, you only see in black faces, you can go down into certain parts of Africa or down there, I forgot the name of the tribes, but in the Bantu, you could look at them and they have very high cheeks and their eyes are completely slanted. So you can tell where the Chinese people actually ascended from.
the, it's just been awful how they've did us on religion. And our people tend to think that even those who feel that they know that white Americans have mistreated us, their grandchildren or great-grandchildren still mistreating us in a lot of ways. They still believe where, but nobody would lie about God, when that's not true. People who are trying to subjugate another people and turn them into slaves, not just physically, but mentally, then uh, they certainly would try to uh, teach them that God looks like me. A lot of people say it doesn't matter what Jesus looked like, it doesn't matter what God looked like or other deity. But the thing is, if it did not matter what Jesus looked like, why don't they show what the original paintings and pictures of Jesus look like? Why don't they show what the original paintings and pictures of the disciples look like? Because that's very important to know if it doesn't matter. Michelangelo was told by the Pope to put the picture of the Holy Family on the, on, on the roof of the chapel. Michelangelo said he that, and the Pope specifically told him to make it European. Michelangelo explained to him that there are no models of a European Holy Family. And so he said, you'll think of something, and he did. He used his, his family. We thought the only guy we had was the one that white people gave us, which was Jesus, okay? And he looked like them. And uh, when we saw them, psychologically, we were transferred that that was deity. If it really was unimportant what he looked like, then why didn't he look like some of the other, the majority of the people on earth? Why would he look like the people who are the minority race on the entire earth? We're not the minority. People always ask me, why do the black church not get rid of the white Jesus and put a blue black Jesus in place with a nappy head? Because black people would stop going. Not only did they hide the color of religious figures throughout Europe, they would hide the colors of other very important people, especially royalty in Europe. A lot of old paintings in Europe, they clearly show African-looking deities. They show the black Madonna and child. This is all throughout Europe. They show black pictures of Jesus. They show African-looking disciples all over Europe. In everything that you're looking at in the, the Roman Catholic Church today, is the exact copy of what they got from Egypt. The high priest, the regular priest, you got the cardinals, you got the bishops, and then you got the, got the pope at top. So you had the pharaoh, you had the high priest, you had the priests, and so you have the same type of, of categorization of people as, they, as they're placed in the temple, but their purposes and what they were telling was different. When racism rose, because racism was a system, and prior to the system of racism evolving as a necessary instrument for the maintenance and protection of the European genotype, Europeans, for many intents and purposes, I would say just about worshiped African people. First three popes were black. You have one named Saint Victor, you have one named Saint Gelasius, you have one pope named Saint Matthias. There was another brother named Saint Benedict, who was a, a patron saint in Europe, well known throughout Italy. Militatus was a black pope. Militatus was the pope during um, the Council of Nicaea. And we've had these brothers who were worshiped throughout Europe and Italy, and we don't talk about it in America, but they're well known in Europe. You, you have one brother, Saint Maurice, who's a, a, a well-known martyr in a, and a religious figure throughout Europe, and you see his statues all over the place. Many of those who early on helped to formulate what is modern day Christianity in Greece and Rome were also African. When you look at Christianity, you're dealing with the Amen priesthood that's coming directly out of uh, ancient Kemet. You're dealing with the rites and rituals of Osiris, the passions of Osiris, the idea of the resurrection of the dead and his son coming forward, Heru, as his living testament to his life. Aset, who the Greeks call Isis, is the, the, um, the, the essence of who Mary is. Um, Nebetet, who is her sister, is who Mary Magdalene is. So that when you look at Christianity, I mean, even when you look at the word uh, Chris or Karas, you're dealing with Kares, Ka means spirit and rest means to rise. The Romans learned your, the passion of Osiris through the Greek. And the Greeks learned it through the Chemites or the Africans from Egypt so that it was just a, a retelling of the same story, superimposing things that they thought they knew. And that becomes what we today call uh, Christianity. Judaism, that is Atonism. That comes directly out, out of the, the, the river, uh, Hapi or Nile. 
And uh, that is why Moses himself was said to be uh, initiated into the priesthood of ancient Egypt. In fact, today, if you were to go to Africa and talk to the children who've been Christianized, they will tell you that their ancestors covenanted with devils. And this is why black people are in the condition they are today. So come turn to Christianity, and of course, you turn to the, to the, to the oppressor's religion, and then you, you eat the gruel that they give you, and at the bottom it says, Jesus saved you. Of course, you're conditioning that person for another thousand years. The falsehood of Christianity has taken a toll on black relationships because really when, when women are taught, or in women and men, but when you're taught as a female that God and Jesus is white, you're going to look at whites as a, somewhat of a savior figure. And you're gonna look at the, the men in your life a little differently. Try to just work on that more. We need to stop going to church every Sunday trying to get along with them and try to get along with the people at home. Some people leave home mad, but they go to church and go in there and then they love the pastor and they love Jesus because there's no accountability. Jesus ain't gonna say, pull your dress down, come in off the street, go clean up the house. You know, Jesus ain't gonna tell them that. And if he do, they ain't gonna listen to that. There is only one race on the planet, and that is the human race. And because of biological climatology, this race was born, nurtured, sustained, civilized, educated in Africa. And Dr. Clark teaches us that after they got their show together, then they took it on the road. The origin of the name Europe comes from a Phoenician goddess named Europa. So the origin of the name Europe has an African origin because the Phoenicians, we're still dealing with, with black African people, the Canaanites and all that. When we talk about Phoenicians, we're still talking about black folks. The first Europeans were a group of Africans called the Grimaldi who had migrated from Africa to Europe between 40 and 60,000 years ago. And in the process of evolution, many of them lost the Africoid genotype and phenotypical features and then went on to look more European-esque. You even see in pre-racist Europe, Africans and Europeans living side by side. In fact, a lot of European families have a African background that they don't like to acknowledge. Queen Charlotte, she was a, a woman of African descent and this is well known throughout Europe. Um, there was another guy, King Charles. Many people say that he has uh, an African origin as well, that he has African ancestry. Um, he, King Charles was referred to as the black boy growing up because he was so dark. And they have pubs over in Europe now called the Black Boy Pub or the Black Boy Inn, which refers to King Charles. Um, there is also knowledge about King Charles being a descendant of the De Medici family. The De Medici family out of Europe, out of Italy, they're known to have that African bloodline as well. One of the De Medici's, Alessandro De Medici, who was a, a ruler in Italy, you look at pictures of him, this dude looks like Ryan Leslie. So you could see that African bloodline running through a lot of these people of royal descent. There were blacks in Scotland. There was um, one black Scottish king named Kenneth the Dub. There are um, figurines of, and carvings of black Scots. The Celtic Druids was the African priesthood that had gone into Europe and had inhabited the islands of what we today call Ireland, inhabited what we today call uh, so-called Great Britain, Scotland and Wales. They, it, it inhabited Holland, inhabited Denmark, was all up in there. Many Greeks and Romans were biracial, to use a modern term which they didn't use, use yeah. back then. They were biracial. Their look okay, could not readily on the surface be absolutely identified as European or black because many of them was of a biracial stock. Hannibal Barker, the great uh, military genius, he comes from an African background. In a lot of movies and on television shows, they will try to Europeanize and whiten up the image of Hannibal Barker, but he was definitely a man of African descent. Um, there are even coins throughout um, Europe in North Africa of Hannibal, showing him, many historians say that there's a coin of a, a black man and there's an elephant on the other side and people say that that is Hannibal. Yes, Hannibal Barkas was um, one of the greatest warriors that ever lived. And what he did, what he accomplished, um, was is now still uh, a, 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 a matter of study in all of the world's uh, military colleges.
Uh, what he did by bringing together, he had the power to bring different factions together. He had different, uh, the, the, um, the Celts, he had uh, the African uh, horsemen, he had different types of uh, armies. So when he went against Rome, they didn't know who to fight because there were so many different styles of warfare. And when you had such a genius and a brilliant man at 22, actually orchestrating after his father, of course, taught him everything that he knew, brought him on campaigns to teach him. He came back and actually took his father's uh, genius to the next level. Septimus Severus was African and he was the one that actually took the fight, uh, took the Roman fight up north into England. The, the Russian language that we know today can be attributed to a black man named Alexander Pushkin. He created the modern Russian language because they were speaking French and other types of language there. Had it not been for someone like Alexander Pushkin, Russians would be speaking French today. A lot of people say that people like Leonardo da Vinci and Sir Isaac Newton, they created a lot of inventions in Europe, but a lot of their inventions can be attributed to the African presence that was in Europe because there was a strong African presence and they were bringing in science and mathematics, so that's where all that came from. Leonardo da Vinci, Galileo, you know, all of them studied with African people. They didn't come up with this. And I, when, when, when people talk about Leonardo da Vinci, the only question that I have as it relates to Leonardo da Vinci is who was his teacher? Who taught Leonardo da Vinci uh, brain anatomy? Who taught him about the airplane? Who taught him this? Tell me who was his teacher. They can't tell you who the teacher is because if they told you who the teacher is, they would have to tell you they were black. Marco Polo, he was considered to be one of the first Europeans to make it over into Eastern Asia. And what Marco Polo did, he took something known as the Silk Road into Asia. And the Silk Road was already established by Africans and other Aboriginal people. And the Silk Road, they would travel this road and they would trade garments. And this is why Italy has always been known to be a, a fashion mecca. People always talk about the quality of Italian clothes, but when we talk about Italian fashion, where did they get that fashion sense from? See, the Italians got that fashion sense from the Moors and the Africans that went in there. They brought those silk garments and, and all those fly clothes into Europe. Even the, the concept of alligator shoes, which is attributed to Italy, the thing is, Alligators are not indigenous to Italy. Crocodiles are not indigenous to Italy. So where did they get those alligator skins and those crocodile skins? They got those from Africa. The Moors brought that in. And the players wear shoes called Mori Gators. Those are some of the most popular shoes around uh, among players, the Mori Gators. The word Mori is a variation of the word Moorish. So we have to know all this stuff. All that is our stuff. That's African stuff. If you look at art, art tends to follow a certain type of a zeitgeist, a certain type of a mindset. People tend not to just wake up and paint one picture in America that looks identical to a picture that was painted in Africa thousands of years ago, okay? And so whenever you see a piece of art, you can best believe that it was inspired by something that was seen prior to. In fact, when you look at some of the great European artists, okay, uh, Van Gogh and all of these types of guys, you will see a lot of their art was inspired by the so-called dark art of West Africa. There has been studies that have put the pieces of Van Gogh and others up next to pieces of traditional African cultural art in West Africa. That art that would be considered a negative, underworldly, dark and demonic. But the great European artists copied what was considered by Europe some of the lowest and most primitive forms of artwork that went on to be considered some of the most successful by them. Another very important African figure in Europe was a black man by the name of Angelo Solomon. He was a guy, he, um, he was a, a Moor, he was a celebrity in Europe, in Austria. Um, he was also known as the father of pure Masonic thought because he was a Mason as well. And this guy, when he died, they literally stuffed his body. They skinned him and stuffed his body and they would have him on display at certain places. So he was a very important figure in Europe. Suleiman taught Mozart. Who's Suleiman? Suleiman's a, a Moor, he's an African. Who is Beethoven? Beethoven was Thoven Bey. He was a Moor. His mother was a Moor. Really? Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, when he went deaf, uh, that melanin kicked in. The inner eye kicked in. He heard music that 
better when he was deaf than he heard it otherwise. There's also another um, uh, myth that he cut the webbing of his hand down to the bone so that he can get a better stretch. So there's some of the 32nd chords that he has. He plays, and most people can't play. They need like two people playing. That's why some people, in certain instances, you see two people playing Beethoven, two pianos playing Beethoven. That's because of what he did when he stretched his finger. Beethoven was called a Moor when he was growing up. Um, Beethoven, there's a book about him called Beethoven's Hair because people were so infatuated with the texture of his hair. So that, that African bloodline runs real deep throughout Europe. And again, he was called a Moor, and the Moors were very important throughout Europe. And it's funny, the importance of the Moor was so deep in Europe, but we rarely hear about them in history books today. You see reference to Moors throughout African history. You see reference to Moors over here in American history. The Moors were African men who went into Europe around 711 AD, and they really civilized Europe because Europe was going through a dark age. Europe was really struggling because after the Vandals had, had basically destroyed Rome, everything was backwards over there. So the Moors went in and they, they ushered in the Renaissance era. They brought in science, mathematics, astrology, they brought all of this into Europe. Uh, they are bringing in hot and cold running water. They are being, uh, bringing in concepts of what we call a cosmopolitan city. They are lighting the streets uh, by lamps uh, in Cordova. You know, they, they build an entire city where the streets for miles you could walk with lamps that lit the street at night. And they had raised sidewalks where people could walk. The kings and queens of Europe lived in barns. Nobody wants to admit that. But they lived in barns. They lived with the animals. And another thing that the Africans brought in was that they said, you know, you cannot let your chicken run, run around in your house and them cows got to go outside. So they created what's called corrals. And corral is an Ethiopian word. It's a K-R-A-L sound. Corral, which is where they would put their animals after they domesticated them. Europeans let them animals run all up and down. This is where the German measles come from. This is where chicken pox come from because Europeans did not have a place for their animals. They just ran all up inside their places and they would carry, as they would get illnesses and sicknesses, they did not bathe, so therefore they had no soap, they had no disinfectant, didn't have alcohol, so that this type of style of living brought illness. When the Moors came in, they, they wrapped all that up along with bringing medicine. What you have happening is that these Gothic kingdoms are gonna bring down, they're gonna sack the Roman Empire. And after they sack the Roman Empire, they're going to take this area over for a while. And then the Moors are going to come in and they're going to push those Visigoths out. And they're going to push them more north and they're going to chase them out of the southern part of the Iberian Peninsula. And that's where the Moors are going to inhabit from 710 until 1492, January 2nd to be exact, when the last great king, uh, Boabdil, uh, was uh, chased out of Granada. The term Moor started to, to become interchangeable with the term black because it was basically the same thing. But when the slave trade started, they tried to objectify um, black people, Moorish people. So they would use the term interchangeably and they would just switch on to calling people black. But if you look at a lot of old documents, there's even sh slave ships called black Moor. if you look at slave records. There was even a boxer out of Virginia who was very popular in the early 1800s named Tom Molyneux, and his nickname was The Moor. So that name was definitely used interchangeably with black or Negro at that time. Moor means black, like Negro, Ethiopian. Moor means black. Moor is not a people. Moor is a color. And they have taken this word Moor, and they have associated Moor with Muslim. There were Moors that weren't Muslim. Moor means black. There were Christian Moors. There were Moors that, that practiced a traditional African faith system. So that Moor means black, simple. When the Moors went into Europe, they changed the uh, appearance of the population. Do you see? So you have Italians, Spaniards being darker than the Scandinavians. A Scandinavian person told me that they never considered the Italians or Jewish people to be white. Do you see, because the lighter people are further north. 
When I went to Europe, I would always look at pictures and I would always see a moor and sometimes I would see like a skull and bones. And many of the moors would have a skull and bones flag. That's what pirates are known for. There were many Moorish pirates. There was even a Barbary War where they were, um, the U.S. was fighting Moorish pirates up in North Africa and the Barbary Coast. And there's even a secret organization called the Skull and Bones. And we know that masonry comes from Moorish science. So there's always a connection there with the Moors. And it's important that as we begin to develop an understanding of this society that it, it's not Freemason as we know it. And that the Moors brought in this knowledge into Europe. Africans brought this knowledge into Europe. And in bringing this knowledge into Europe, the Knights Templars and other organizations were born out of this. And peoples of European descent were exposed to alchemy, okay? The periodic table of elements, the laboratory, how to take information, how to take elements and atoms, and to begin to manipulate them, to make them into different types of molecules. The basic one is hydrogen, two hydrogen is helium, three hydrogen is lithium, six is carbon, eight is oxygen. So you, so, so you have this alchemy that's going to come and they're going to begin to study, they're going to begin to learn, they're going to become, they're, they're going to create societies that's going to develop an understanding. This is going to be what eventually is going to become Freemasonry because only a select group of people in Europe is going to be exposed to this information. But the secret of Masonry of who we really are, the Moors, is being here on this land, this particular land because it was called, in many names, you had Turtle Island that we called it, or Tula, or El Morocco, the different terms that we had. And the original map of America was written by a guy named Idrisi. Mm. The original map was written in um, Sanskrit. Antarctica was actually mapped by a moor. And most people don't know it was mapped by a moor. And they have old topographical evidence of old maps of Antarctica. That's why the Nazis fled there because they knew that there were places there under the ice that they could actually inhabit and hide. We know for a fact that the, that the first Umayyad and Abbasid dynasty, we know they were black. We know that they were what we call Arabs, but there's no such thing as an Arab. An Arab, I call them Afrabs, because to be an Arab, you must be black. That's what makes you an Arab, that you're black. The term Arab, that's a, a loose term. Arab doesn't really identify nationality or race because there are Moors who were Arabs, there were Moors who were Christians. So the word Moor, a lot of people try to make Moor synonymous with light or white skin, but that's not necessarily the case because you remember even when Barack Obama was, was trying to get elected in America, when people tried to slander him, they would say, oh, he's an Arab. So people know that an Arab, is, it really means non-white, but they try to make the term interchangeable. They switch the term up at their disposal. So that even if you did want to say Arabs, they're not Eurasians, they are mixtures of Eurasians and Africans that would congregate in certain areas once they came out of the Ice Age, and then they would come across, they would travel uh, west into <clears throat> what we call North Africa, but they would not come in any large numbers until thousands of years after the fact. We know that Tariq was an African. He was the general that crossed over in July of 711 into, into what we call Spain today. It wasn't called Spain then, it didn't exist. These were little kingdoms, a king of Spain called Alphonse X, very smart man. What he did was he began to translate the works out of Arabic. Now Arabic is an African language, by the way. And Antara was the one that gave it syntax and grammar. Because prior to what we today call Islam, Arabic didn't exist. Arabic was the language of the Quran. And that came out of Africans. That Spanish and French and Portuguese, Italian, Romanian, these languages would, would codify themselves once the Moors came in and brought civilization and brought in a semblance of language and syntax they then would take Latin and they would branch off and then you would have Spanish. That's why all of the languages are related to Latin. That's why they call the Latin languages. A lot of the European royal family's coat of arms, you can clearly see depictions of Moors. Many of the original castles of Europe were built by the Moors. Um, there are many Moorish castles in Spain, Italy, England, 
and some of these castles they can be seen in Africa as well a lot of people don't know that there are castles all throughout Ethiopia we never see that on television we always see the cats and the, the dudes in the mud huts and people starving in Ethiopia but there are very well designed castles all over Ethiopia and a lot of the Moors you can see pictures and paintings of them in castles in Europe you can look at old paintings and see this what you're looking at when you see the cathedrals cathedrals that's all Moorish architecture taken to the extent to the next level in fact we know for a fact and I have to get this specific book once more but all of the cathedrals that you see built in England the, the, uh, the island of England were built by the Moors by the time the Moors got into Europe, the illiteracy rate was very high because there was no practical reason for people to read at the time because people were really trying to survive. So the only people who could read at the time were monks or religious figures. So the Moors went into to Europe and they started to establish universities. The first university created in Europe, University of Salamanca, uh, they created the education system that Europe adopted. They brought in what became classical music. Um, they're the ones who uh, brought architecture and fineries. In fact, it, it was so advanced that the teachers in the Moorish uh, paradigm during their, in the Iberian Peninsula, the teachers under the Moors got the equivalent of $40,000 a year back then. That's how advanced they were. In fact, everywhere in Europe sent their best to go and learn there, just like they sent them to Timbuktu, just like they sent them over to, um, to Luxor, just like they sent them over to where all these areas where you see Africans and high sciences were, they sent them there to Spain to learn. Well, the, the Moors brought in the first music conservatory into Valencia, Spain. They brought Ziriab into Spain, and he brought in a chordophone known as the lewd. L apostrophe O U D. We call it lute, L U T E. It's a chordophone. And it, it has four chords. And, you know, the uh, hormones of the body, the humors, uh, Africans would heal people when you had clogs in your liquid systems, okay? Whether it was your mucus or whether it was your hormones, whether it was your phlegm, whether it was your blood. Whatever was clogged up, what they do is that they would put this this chordophone over your body and they would strum, right? And in strumming, the vibration of the string would open up whatever was clogged, okay? Ziriab, in his brilliance, added a fifth string. And his fifth string was for plasma, which is invisible liquid, which is the origin of the universe. And this just healed your entire system, your entire body. When you look at a piano, a piano is a harp turned sideways. That's why when you look at a, a, a baby grand piano, it, it's shaped like a harp. Then you take the top up and you put a stick there so that it's open, right? So that Africans said that instead of strumming strings to make the sound, what they would do is they would put it to its side, encase it in wood, and then you would hit keys. And the keys then would hit the strings and it would be a different kind of sound. And so when, when, when you're looking at uh, Baroque music, which Bach is really given credit for developing, that came out of Africa. Okay, Africa. In fact, Africans have the finger piano that, that, you know, that they play. All they did was take the concept of the finger piano, the xylophone, and this harp turned sideways, and that became piano. Out of that came what we call classical music. And this is why when I hear African folk talk about, because I enjoy classical music. I play classical music, I enjoy listening to classical music, but that's black music, that's soul music. And black folk used classical music as soul music, but, but Europeans took it. And so now when we look at what we call classical music, Tchaikovsky or, or Beethoven or Mozart, or any of the so-called classical pianists or classical musicians, we say, oh man, that's white music. That's not white music. We don't know our history. Blackamoor jewelry is this very expensive jewelry that's sold throughout Europe among wealthy people. And it's jewelry that shows black people in, in gold, diamonds. It's this very elaborate, beautiful jewelry with African people. And it's very popular in Europe. King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella, when they, you know, ended the Moorish conquering in Europe. And at that point, 
that's when the bullfighting started as a game and I say the symbolism in the bullfights you know like you have the matador in his suit of lights and he is spending his time getting ready to kill the black bull which I say represents the Africans and so they even have the running of the bulls today where you have Spaniards dressed in white clothes run you know running but being chased in the past it used to be mostly black bulls would be chasing them and so I say that symbolism related to the what seven or eight hundred years when the Moors had conquered Spain and then the whites defeated the Moors and pushed them back into Africa but it's being played out the fear of the black bull meaning the black male and in response the game ends when the bull is killed you know when we were growing up we would always see the toy monkey that you can wind up and it had the symbols and or it had drums and you wind it up and it would clap if you look at the way that monkey is dressed the monkey would usually have on a vest a fez there are even some paintings of the monkey wearing a turban so when you see the turban we're talking about moors when you see black folks with turbans so People know who the Moors are. You know the racial epithet that black folks look like monkeys. That monkey with the Moorish garb on, that's a way of them kind of low-key insulting black folks without us knowing our, our origin because they know who we are. We don't know who we are. The reason why we don't understand Native American history, we don't understand the African presence in America, we don't understand culture is because when we study in our textbooks in America the presence of Native American people, we study the 13 colonies. And then we got this Westwood Ho thing going on, where we now are, are, are meeting the indigenous people as the European met the indigenous people. But if you want to study indigenous peoples, you have to study the Mississippi River because the Mississippi River was to indigenous people what the Nile River was, or the Happy River was to African people. It was go back to a book called The Life of Columbus, written by John Boyd Thatcher in 1905. He wrote in three volume set, where he chronicles this man we call Columbus. Cristobal Colon was a very shrewd individual. He was Spanish, and he was Jewish. He was Sephardim. And he is involved in, in, in traveling to Africa with the Moors in the 1400s. We, we find him on the coast of West Africa, between West Africa and the Canary Islands in 1482. He's involved in the enslavement trade with the Portuguese. That's why the great majority of Africans that find themselves in this part of the world, the great majority of them are in Brazil. For every 100 Africans stolen from Africa, 38 of those 100 are in Brazil. Brazil is the largest African community outside of the African continent. So he was already in Africa. He came from West Africa. He was in West Africa when he found out that the Africans had a way to get to this point. In fact, from southern parts of Africa towards the mid-continent, there was a way to get to America in half the time because there was a current called the River Jordan. That wasn't his first time here. He came in many times before that. Really? And understood that he were here on this land. See, you gotta remember, he didn't never come up to North America. He went right. to the South America, he never st stepped foot up here. And when you study his, uh, I think it's his son's records, his son will actually tell you about these things. His son will tell you who was on the ship and how he saw the same people he saw in Africa over here on this land, and they were Moors. Pedro Alonso Nino, he was the one of the chief navigators who came over to America with Christopher Columbus. And many people say if it wasn't for the Moors being on those ships with Columbus, they would have never found the new world of America. There, there's evidence of of many Africans that are on those three ships and the other ships that would be, because Cristobal didn't know where he was going. He didn't know the Native American peoples. Even the Spaniards would bring Estevanico, an African, to Spain, and he is the one that's gonna cross over Florida through Arizona, through, the, uh, through that southern uh, west, and befriend indigenous people because he was a healer. Africans have been going back and forth engaging in cultural trade and other forms of economic trade way before there was any mention of anyone by the name of Columbus. So his voyage was nothing new for a human being to make. It may have been new for a European, but it was definitely not new for the African. We had already been doing it. In fact, there's maps in some of the museums around the world that show how 
those involved in the maritime trade would actually get from West Africa. The Piri Reyes map was a map that was found by a Turkish explorer named Piri Reyes, and the map comprised of longitude and latitude, which was not discovered by Europeans yet, and the map comprised of different ancient maps from, from Arabia and um, Egypt. These maps showed that there was a, a North and South American continent. Since Africans have already been to America thousands of years. We, we can track the 18th dynasty of Egypt on the Mississippi River. So we know that there are Africans in America. They are coming back and forth between Africa and America frequently, working together with the indigenous peoples here. And in fact, the indigenous people themselves are now African. That's why when a European came here, he called the indigenous people the red man. You don't get to be red without some brown and black. When the Jesuit priests from Spain and Portugal came over to the Americas and they rode back, they would classify the Native Americans, in many cases, as Negro. What we know as Memphis, as the capital of ancient Kemet, was over here in the West. Mm. See, most people don't know that. And that all of the stories from Cortez, as he states in his book, and all of the diaries of Balboa right. and them all came, all actually said that they, were, they came into and were confronted with African peoples, especially of the Mali dynasties. When you're looking at the original American people, the Olmec people are a mixture. You're basically going to see them being born in what we call the Gulf of Mexico. They're going to come out of three major cities, uh, Tres Zapotes, San Lorenzo, and La Venta. These are going to be where the Olmec stone heads are found. This is going to be where the first temples, pyramids, tombs are going to be found. The Bonimpak tribe, that was um, a group of Aboriginal people living in the Mexico area. If you go down to Mexico and you look at these murals, you can see the Bonimpak tribe, and they clearly have distinctive African features, African nose, lips, hair. We know that there are pyramids and heads in Guatemala, there, Nicaragua, you can go throughout Central America, you can go through Mesoamerica, you can go to South America, as far as Peru, and you can find the presence of African peoples in this area, in the ancient world, not just during the, the movement of Africans during the enslavement process, but these are individuals that are gonna be here and establish culture in this part of the world. Evidence of Africans in America, he wrote a book, Frank Joseph. Now this is a man who did not set out to write a book on African presence in America, he just was honest enough to record what he found. He find coins with African heads on them. He finds um, vessels that people drank from with African heads. You have a gentleman by the name who was, who was transcended. His name was Alexander Von Wootner. When we went to Mexico to study with Dr. Van Sertima in 1984, we went to his museum, his studio. He showed us over 60,000 artifacts that were African in nature, not just brought from Africa, but built in America, revering Africa. Mansa Musa, who became, uh, what's his name, uh, Montezuma. So Mansa Musa was actually Montezuma, and he was a Mali king who came over here uh, with the flotilla of 200 ships, Abu Bakari II. He sent a flotilla of ships, 200 of them, in, in 1306 and then again in 1311 and together that constituted 500 ships that sailed here from the west coast of Africa. There was also a map called the Walsamula map and this map was considered the first map to have the name America in it. This map was sold to the Library of Congress for like 10 million dollars. When they found the Walsamula map, Walsamula said that they basically made the map out of things that were comprised or maps that were comprised and left over by the Egyptians. A lot of people don't know that the state of California was named after a mythological black queen called Queen Khalifa. Now the original California Indians, if you see them, the California Indians really look black. The Ohlone Indians, if you see paintings of the Ohlone Indians out of California, you couldn't tell them from an African tribe. If you look at the original paintings of the Mojave Indians, you couldn't tell them from an African tribe. These were clearly dark looking people who had some type of African bloodline. A lot of the founding of America was based on Moorish science. 
if you see paintings of the inauguration of George Washington, it looked like a Masonic ritual. So again, masonry is based on Moorish science. So they would have these Moorish advisors around them. If you look at old paintings of George Washington, you will see George Washington standing next to a black man with a turban. And remember, when you see the black man with the turban, that's a Moor, that's not a slave. See, people automatically assume that black is slave, but slaves didn't wear no turbans. Because remember, slaves weren't allowed to practice no Islam or any other kind of religion except Christianity. So when you see that turban, that's a black man. And there's a few pictures of George Washington and other people with Moors or black men with turbans standing next to him. When you see that, just know that those are Moors. The Lumbee and the Melungeon people, these were an Aboriginal tribe of people who were living in the Americas and they came over and a lot of people act like they don't know where they came from because they were classified as free people of color. And there were other groups called red bones. This is where we get calling a light-skinned person a red bone. These are old terms, and these people had come over before Columbus. They've been over for a long time. And again, the Melungeons were almost classified as black or Negro, but they called them free people of color. And in some circles, they did classify the Melungeons and the Lumbees as Negro. Abraham Lincoln's mother came from a Melungeon background. And people were very aware of this back then when they were running against Abraham Lincoln in the campaign, his opponents would use that information and try to use it against them. Because remember, back in those days, in order to insult somebody or in order to um, stain somebody's image, you just had to say they were Negro or they were mixed with a Negro or they had a Negro background. And they would do that with Abraham Lincoln. There's old pictures and, and newspapers of Abraham Lincoln dressed up like a Moor. They would call him Abraham Africa Noose. Benjamin Banneker, he was a black man who created the first known almanac. He helped design the city of Washington, D.C. He was a descendant of the Dogon tribe of West Africa, very well versed in astrology. Well, his name itself, he was a Moor also. He was the first one that started the almanac. He was a Moor. In fact, there's a book by Charles Cerami on Benjamin Banneker. In fact, what's interesting about Benjamin Banneker is that they trace his ancestry back to the Dogon people of Mali that what Benjamin Banneker is best known for is his knowledge of agriculture and astronomy. In fact, he was the one that wrote the first Farmer's Almanac. Basically, when you're watching your weather report on the news today and they tell you what, what the temperature was in 1920, that's the Farmer's Almanac. And he was the one that was able to codify, write down um, how to deal with the earth according to the seasons. See, Benjamin Banneker and Lafont were building Washington, D.C. And what society attempts to tell you is that, uh, uh, that Benjamin ba Banneker had a photographic memory, and he did, not to take that from the brother. But L'Enfant did not build Washington, D.C. Because whoever built Washington, D.C. had to have been a master astronomer. Because Washington, D.C., as our brother Tony Browder has shown us, is laid out according to the heavens. But not only did he know astrology, but he's, he had a photographic memory. And he studied the plans of the previous architect and knew where everything was in his head and finished Washington, D.C. from his head. Well, Benjamin Banneker also was the first one to really bring the um, clock, as we know it today, to its highest form. The clock that we use as a watch, okay? Now, a lot of folk not gonna admit this, but what is that big clock called in London? It's called Big Ben. It's named after Benjamin Banneker. But nobody wants to admit this. During slavery, there was something called the Seminole Wars. There were many slave rebellions in this country that a lot of people don't talk about. In the 1800s, there were really a lot of slave rebellions and people were very nervous about what was going on, what had gone on in Haiti because Haiti had, had made themselves independent by having a big slave uprising. There was um, the Nat Turner Rebellion in the early 1800s. People were still shook about that. You had the Denmark Vesey. He was going to have a slave rebellion in South Carolina. That got foiled, but they had up to 9,000 people ready to put in work. So a lot of people were very nervous about slave rebellions in this country. The Seminole War, it was a war of Native American and black people mixed together, calling themselves Seminoles, because there's no such thing as a Seminole Indian. A Seminole Indian, that's, it's, it's a made up term. 
um, a Seminole basically means runaway by definition. A lot of black people were fighting for their freedom. The image of black people just sitting around waiting on people to free them, that's a, a, an image to keep us submissive. It was also uh, not economically feasible because of the rebellions that were going on. See, we're not talking about just slavery. We think there was slavery and there was a couple of rebellions like Nat Turner, who, by the way, my wife is a descendant of Nat Turner. And they were thinking that that it was just Nat Turner. They were, I mean, they were burning and destroying and there was true guerrilla warfare going on. Ending slavery was not the reason a civil war was fought at all. The civil war was fought to bring the South back into unison with the North and to destroy the economic advantage that the South had had due to slavery. They cared nothing about the lives of black people. They cared nothing about the way that we were treated. They cared nothing about African life. It was not about protecting us because they had somehow waken up and realized that we were human beings too. No, the South was growing too powerful. Capitalism started to rise. But what began to happen was is that in capitalism rising, it began to stifle capitalism because capitalism demands as an economic system that people are always trying to rise to the higher. They're competing. Competition fuels capitalism. But if you could buy an African for $300 and then pay somebody for 20 years $300 a year, which would you do? You'd buy someone one time for $300. But that's gonna stifle capitalism because what's gonna happen is that's gonna be no competition because what European is gonna compete for a job that they could buy an African to do? So the North said, look, enslavement of African people is stifling capitalism. And so the South said, so what you want me to do? They said, well, you gotta free your Africans. To free my Africans, well, how am I gonna get my money? North said, don't worry about it, we'll take care of it. They said, I mean, we don't trust you. No, we're not gonna sell our, we, we are not gonna stop the enslaving Africans. We're just not going to do it. North said, but you have to because it's gonna stifle capitalism and we're gonna choke with overproduction without an ability to sell what we're, what, what we're South said, but that's not my problem because I can sell my raw materials any place in the world. The North said, but then what would happen to us? We have factories. The South said, well, that sounds like a personal problem to me. I don't care what happens to you. North said, but you can't do that. The South said, we're going to do that. We're not freeing Africans. They said, you've got to free Africa. We're not freeing. In fact, the South said to the North, you know, I'm tired of talking to you. I'm going to secede. I'm not even going to talk to you no more. In fact, I'm not even part of what your colonies are anymore. I'm going to... North said, you can't do that. The South said, watch. That started the Civil War. Well, one of the big things that occurred right at the end of the Civil War was that Europeans began to form unions. In fact, the workers' union is an outgrowth of slavery and the Civil War. When it looked like the cause was lost for the Confederacy, white men began to organize themselves into labor forces. Why did they do this? Because you are about to see two million enslaved Africans set free who have skills that equal or supersede your own who would now be able to compete and buy with you for contracts and livelihood. That was a significant area of concern for white men. Okay, so if I was a, white, if a, a European who was looking for work, couldn't find any because it had already been hired up to the slaves of a certain master. So when the Civil War came about and when slavery was about to end, that intensified because now slaves would be aggressively looking for work because when slavery ended, they had nothing to which they could claim their own to make a living. So that bothered Europeans and they set up agreements okay with those who had industries and those who had stores that you could only hire someone who was white who belonged to a particular labor's union in fact some of the first unions were started right here in pennsylvania and a lot of black people felt to realize the origin of the union the union is nothing but a collective force of white people who are protecting jobs for themselves and keeping them away from black people the fight came that after slavery ended we had jobs which is what you mentioned earlier, that we were starting to get it together because we had skills. It was the white man that didn't have any skills because we are the ones who had been forced to work the black man had. And so part of that destruction, doing all that Jim Crow and everything, was fighting against the brothers who were trying to be in business and who were trying to work. And that fight between the black man and the white man about the construction business has continued down to the day, which is why you can go into a city like Cincinnati and in Philadelphia, where the black population is over 50 or 60 percent, 
And the white contractors own 99% of all of the jobs in the city. And that's nationwide. That's a, and they've kept us out of it. They've kept us out of the unions. This is what that was. But it was the black man who used to have all of the skills for building. We were the contractors, our people. Abraham Lincoln himself said, if I could keep Africans enslaved and preserve the union, I would do that. Abraham Lincoln didn't want to free African people. He had to because of capitalism, because he saw what was happening. But look at the mean trick. Let's continue the story. Now you have Africans that are free, who are part and parcel of America, who, who deserve not just a break, but they need a little bit more because they deserve, because they built America and made America what it was. So between 1865 and, and 1877, we have what's called the Reconstruction Period where black folk were going out, going to school, graduating, becoming doctors, lawyers. They were speaking Greek, Latin, better than people who taught Greek and Latin. They were going in, becoming senators, they were becoming Congress people, they were becoming part of the world arena. Europeans got scared, so what did they do? They, they, they started an organization that would attack black folk. It was called the Tea Party, no, not the Tea Party, it was called the Ku Klux Klan, I'm sorry. I, I'm, 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 I'm jumping up in history here. They're gonna to start to pass laws where segregation is going to exist because they don't want Africans to be able to take the jobs that are, that are gonna be fueled by capitalism. So what do they do? They said, bring me your weak, your poor, your homeless. Bring me your sick, your ignorant. And that's when the immigration came. And that's who got the jobs that was supposed to go to black folk. A lot of people don't know the original design for the Statue of Liberty was a black female. As a matter of fact, in a museum in New York, you can see the original design of the Statue of Liberty, which is a black woman. When the French artist created the Statue of Liberty, it was supposed to represent the end of slavery. On the original model, there were chains on the hands and feet, as we know. When the statue got to America, they wanted to erase any references to slavery from the statue, but the artists really fought to keep the chains on there because this is your art. You don't want people tampering with your art. And if you look, the chain is still on the foot of the Statue of Liberty to this day. Well, the story was that it was a gift of the French to the slaves and that the original statue had the picture of a black woman. Uh, the original model for it, and it had a, a distinctly African face. But it was Europeanized because the people in the United States did not want to have a black face sitting up there in the harbor, so they carved it out in France. They had to go back to the drawing board and remodel the face after the, uh, what they call the um, patron saint of Manifest Destiny. So the patron saint of Manifest Destiny, that's her face on the, um, what do you call it, Statue of Liberty, which was transposed from the African face. In fact, you see the patron saint of Manifest Destiny in the symbol for Columbia Pictures at the beginning of the movies. That's the patron saint of Manifest Destiny. Post-slavery Africans were consolidated. They were more together than ever. Se segregation gave them the necessity or created the necessity for them to maintain a type of co cohesion with each other, no matter if it was infighting. They still had their self-interest and the collective interest. So we didn't know who the enemy was back there. Today, after uh, integration, we don't know who the enemy is anymore. They've changed the history because we seem to be able to do things that other nationalities can't do, and we make it seem easy. We make it seem pretty, and we are arrogant about it, and we have fun with it, and you know, it's just, just a great thing. And they don't want that. They want us to play the game the way that they have set it up to play. It's necessary to destroy a man's mind in order to maintain control of him. If a man knows who he is, and continues that into his legacies, to his children, and you have problems controlling that man. Understanding history is one thing, but understanding why the colors were hidden, that's another thing. And the problem is, see, we can't exclude racism, white supremacy. That's the thing we can't escape. A lot of black folks try to avoid talking about it because it makes everybody uncomfortable, but it's a real thing and we have to acknowledge it. A lot of black folks don't really understand racism. 
And if you don't understand something, you're not going to be able to effectively deal with it and counter it. Racism, as I understand it, is a global system for the genetic survival of the global white minority population. We usually don't think of whites as being a minority, but they're a tiny minority, fewer than one-tenth of the people on the planet, and they are genetic recessive, meaning that if a black person and a white person mix the president, Barack Obama, you get a colored person. So if you want to maintain an oppressive process on a group of people, you certainly don't inform them of the depths and details of their history. Just like you don't give them adequate education, you don't maintain uh, adequate housing, uh, etc. And every morning that a black person turns on the television, they are getting their dose in indoctrination with white supremacy. You see, so if you turn on the TV or pick up a newspaper, look at a magazine, unless you understand the system, then you have a grid to put things in their proper perspective. But without that, you are constantly and continuously being indoctrinated by the system itself. You see, but the very fact that people who classify themselves as white would find themselves saying, something's wrong with your genetics, something's wrong with your genetics. In psychiatry, we call that projection. In other words, if I have to keep focusing on your genetics, I must have some doubt about my genetics, and we have the basis for that, meaning you know, the ability to produce melanin pigment or skin color is a genetically dominant trait. The issue with black people is this. We hate who we are and love who we can be. We hate who we are, Africans, and love who we can be, Europeans. We do not want anybody to remind us of who we are, which is why we shun Africa. We are trying to get out of who we are. And we think that if we act white enough, and marry white enough, and dye our hair white enough, then maybe white folks will start treating us like white folks. You are an African. White people have never forgotten it, no matter how much you try to, and you will always be treated like an African. It doesn't matter how many doctors you got, it doesn't matter how light you are, it doesn't matter if your wife is white, you can ask Tiger Woods about that, you will still be treated like a black person. And even today, if they don't sanction what you do and authenticate it, then it is considered non-valid. And that's unfortunate because that's not true and we can't allow that to be true. And it was the same as with my work and a lot of other people out here. If you have not attended their school and learned their method, whatever they say it is, uh, they have no respect for independent study. When they used to be proud of in America, the self-made man, the self-made woman, that used to be it until it got out of hand and we started creating so many things, you know. William Shockley, who I debated, about black genetic inferiority. He was a Nobel Prize laureate. He was one of the inventors of the transistors, a professor at Stanford University. Now he could teach and talk about black genetic inferiority as long as he wanted, but a black person cannot talk about why racism exists and continue to teach at a university level. George Wallace found out, he said when, that's Governor George Wallace, yes. uh, he said when he first went into politics in the South in Alabama, he thought that poor whites, if they would join with blacks, they would have a great deal of political power. Do you see? And so that coming together of the poor whites and the poor blacks. And he said he soon realized that whites did not care if they didn't have roads, if they didn't have hospitals, if they didn't have schools. They just wanted to know that they were better than the blacks. Now I say that that reasoning comes because the deeper concern was genetic annihilation. You see, in other words, if the poor blacks and poor whites came together and they were working together and functioning together, and then they would pretty soon intermix sexually together. 
then the end result would be white genetic annihilation. Racism definitely took a toll on black male-female relationships, especially in the 1960s, because in the 1960s, black men and black women, they were doing what they were supposed to have done in, for a long time, which was fight together against white supremacy, against racism. And they were doing this with the civil rights movement. So what happened, people had to come in and infiltrate and have a divide and conquer um, strategy between black men and black women in 1964 government came in and they pulled black women to the side and they started to classify black women and women in general as minorities. In 1964, that's the first time they classified women as minorities. So they started to give them set-asides and benefits and then they created the, the feminist movement and a lot of sisters branched off into that and that kind of created a rift because a lot of sisters stopped fighting for civil rights and they started to fight for women's rights, but women's rights weren't being jeopardized in the black community. Our first priority was racism, and we should have dealt with that first. We wanted to be free. We didn't need any boundaries, need no man to tell us what to do. Well, we hadn't had no man to tell us what to do anyway. You couldn't tell us what to do in slavery, so who, you know? We didn't really have no fight with you about that. That was the white woman's fight with her man, but we took it on. I want to be free. Ain't nobody going to tell me what to do. And then women started having babies, what they call out of wedlock, and then that got to be okay too. Oh, it's all right. Once it got accepted by society, all of the rest of the people, then it was okay then to just have a baby. In fact, I don't even want him for nothing but to just have a baby. And then we started saying, oh, I'm going to be the mother and the father. All oh, kind of nonsense. And so what happened was that movement, and there never was a sisterhood in the women's liberation movement between the black woman and the white woman. Because you have to understand, in the tactic of the art of war, when you want to destroy a stronger enemy, you have to get rid of the, the cultural perspective of uh, authority. So what do you do? You have to destroy the man in the society. And that's exactly what they did. I talk about this in my book. You have to destroy the masculine principle, which is the head of the family. That's part of it. The other part is to get rid of the environment and the ways and means for the head or the authority of that family to become and stay the authority and the head of that family. And that is to be the provider and the protector. Take away his means of providing. Take away his means of protecting his family. And he no longer has any rights or any kind of uh, power. So when you have done that, you have now undermined the glue that keeps a family together. Men don't have to be men anymore. So what's the best thing to do? Since you're giving so many favors to women, I might as well be a woman, or at least act like one, and therefore I'm no longer, as Dr. Francis Crest said, I'm no longer a threat. If whites are involved in their genetic survival, and they are threatened by black male masculinity, then it will occur, I have to reduce his masculinity. Yeah, we just recently had the president at Morehouse have to say the male students cannot wear high heel shoes and dresses and carry purses. So something is happening, again, within the total context of a system of racism and white supremacy. Neely Fuller, who wrote the uh, textbook for victims of racism, a number of years ago, in, 19, in the late mid-70s, he used to say in the system, because he was the first person to talk about racism as a system, and he said that as the system of racism and white supremacy moves on, the system is going to have black men wearing dresses. Now, to hear that in the 70s, people said, oh, this is way out, and here we are. Do you see, there's some black pediatricians who are saying we are developing epidemic levels of the effeminization of young black males. Well, I say the pants hanging it, sagging down, is just a subconscious invitation for homosexuality. You see, it's revealing the buttocks. See, so the pants are getting lower and lower and lower. The next step is to step out of the pants altogether. And so you step out of the pants, you're going to put on a dress. The effeminization is an essential ingredient 
of white genetic survival and the only thing that can prevent it is black people becoming conscious or becoming determined that this is not going to happen to them because if the black men are destroyed then the black people are gone and we have a state of genocide. They always have in the media that black children inherently have lower IQs. They always show these studies of black children's IQs being lower, but what they leave out is that African immigrants, they come over to America and they outperform everybody else academically, including Asians and including whites. Because first of all, IQ is so culture-based. I mean, I mean, IQ doesn't exist. And the evidence of that is just look around you. Because if that's the case, Europeans ain't doing that great either. Because compared to the world, out, out of 166 countries that was tested, the United States of America, European American students, there was only 12 countries did worse than the United States of America. So IQ, it has nothing to do with, that's just, that's a lot of game. First, the concept of IQ, the intelligence quotient, comes out of Germany during the rise of Hitler. It was a German white man by the name of Wilhelm Stern who created the intelligence quotient for population extermination reasons. He was later rejected and put out of Hitler's camp, but the IQ is an invention of Nazi Germany. Now, the first IQ test ever used in, a, in the world comes out of France. A European named Alfred Binet, at the request of the French government, was asked to design a test whereby the French government could group or track the students based on how bright they were and identify those who they felt would not be successful in school at all. A white man from New Jersey, Henry H. Goddard, who was a member of the American Eugenics Society, went to France, got a copy of the Binet Scales, first white IQ test brought the Binet scales back to America, made copies of it, and distributed it across the country to white folks everywhere. And Henry H. Goddard himself said that with this tool, we will be able to accomplish our eugenicidal ends. So from the beginning, the IQ test was never meant as an objective standard to see how smart black kids was. It was used to justify access to opportunity, and extermination and racial control. And they're not being taught. Uh, I have a, a, a boy, Hassan, he's 10. And I took him to school and uh, he was at the genius level because I had taught him at home. You know, he was like seven years old. He had an IQ of 153. Well, they made sure they dumbed him down. And two years later, he was barely passing. I had to take him, I said, and I fought with him every day. They snatched it. It's like when our children in school are saying, that, you know, when somebody's real smart, they say, oh, you acting white. They don't understand that people that look like them invented thinking. In fact, we were thinking before Europeans were even on the planet. Yet we don't know this about ourselves. And because our children are not familiar with this history of themselves, they can't see themselves because they're taught that slaves came from Africa. And so therefore, I'm going to act like a slave because that's who I am. But they don't see themselves as in hotel or they don't see themselves as Queen Nzinga, or Prussia, a second dynasty female doctor, or they don't see themselves as Hypatia, a great mathemat uh, mathematic uh, mathematician and medical doctor that was skinned alive by the Romans because they did not want to show an African woman being so intelligent, and dragged through the community to show people what, this, what they were going to do to this African woman. Uh, the African man and the African woman's mind does not operate along European paradigmal structures. So if you're teaching him one way, he's going to automatically fail. If the system is structured for him to fail, of course he's going to fail. He's going to say, see, see, I told you. That's ridiculous. We know that genius is definitely and always has been in the African mind because everywhere you go on the planet, you see African genius once left to its own accord. But when manipulated, you could turn him or that genius in her into something that is demonic. Back in 1964, they created a whole other way of teaching your, your son. It was called outcome-based education. It wasn't about you learning math and knowing what math was. A, uh, one and one equals two. Two was the answer. If you got three, you were wrong. But today, if one and one and you say three, you say, oh, you tried. 
It's all right. Uh, we'll pass you on. That's all right. You, you, you did your best. See, so what they did was in outcome-based education, it became more feminized. It became more of a communal participation in the act or idea of learning, not learning. If you could come together and participate in group things, that showed that you had the ability to be passed on into the new society. If you were a rogue and you jumped out and said, no, I ain't going for this, which is where all the gangs started coming from, because most of the males could not deal in an education system that was like this. And this is why you see most of the females getting the PhDs today, because the system was structured in such a way that took away the challenge that men needed. And it was through the IQ test, which is the number one weapon of special education, which is the number one weapon of special education, they continue to overdiagnose and misdiagnose black children as being mentally retarded who are not. I had a case in Philadelphia this past summer right here. Some white lawyers asked me to come in and participate in the case. Black boy, eighth grade, diagnosed as mentally retarded. I evaluated the brother, found out he was never mentally retarded. But when I looked into the previous IQ tests that were given, they misinterpreted the data. So this young man been walking around with a diagnosis of mental retardation since he was in eighth grade. He's now a young adult. And although he's been told by me and his parents that you are not retarded and you were never retarded, the self-esteem, the, the self-concept, the self-image is so crushed. This brother probably gonna need therapy for the next 20 years because he bought into what? A superficial label that white society has given them. The gifted movement really started to take form right after the Brown versus Board of Education decision in 1954. The Supreme Court said you could no longer use race as a factor to segregate groups. But they didn't say you couldn't use disability or ability. So the white folks said, guess what? We're gonna come up with a gifted program. We're gonna segregate the white kids from the black kids after Brown versus Board because we're gonna say the white kids are too smart. It's not based on skin, it's based on ability. Problem with that, it didn't work too well because a lot of white kids didn't score high on the IQ test. So they said, guess what? This is working for some white kids, but it ain't working for all. So guess what? In 1963, the same year that the Civil Rights Bill was introduced, a Chicago psychologist created the learning disability. The learning disability. And it is through the IQ test and the learning disability that so many of our children are marshaled into special ed kids where they'll probably never learn to read on grade level by the time they graduate. You see, it's like if I took an animal and put it in a cage and so the animal couldn't grow well. And then I'll say, oh, look at this deformed animal. Do, do you see, I don't say, I made this creature deformed because of the conditions that I subjected him or her to. And the very fact that, in other words, the logic, in my view, if you felt that blacks were genetically, inherently inferior, you can give them the very best of conditions and they would not be able to perform or function. You see, but the need to deprive, you know, at the same time that people are saying, oh, it's cold outside, make sure your dog is in. Make sure your dog gets all the nutrients for growth and development because you're not fearful that the dog is going to take over the human beings. Do you see, but once you start depriving systematic deprivation, it means, well, I must be afraid of these people maybe overtaking me if I allow them the same conditions, opportunities that I set forth for myself. The problem of the 21st century in America is what are we gonna do with these 40 million Africans who we do not want here? That is the number one political domestic issue in America. Why? Because AIDS is killing them, but it ain't killing them fast enough. The police are killing them, but they ain't killing them fast enough. The prisons, we are throwing them in there by the dozens every day. But guess what? They still having babies, okay? We're killing the babies on the uh, delivery table, but it ain't getting rid of them fast enough. I was at a meeting last night with a group of parents who have children who are not being successful in high school. And at that meeting, there was a school member who said that she felt in the meeting 
we were spending too much time discussing the problems and that we hadn't begin to generate the solutions. And I told her that I disagreed with her. And I explained to her why. I said, one of the biggest problems we have as African people is that we are too quick to rush out and fix something you know nothing about. If the engine in my car is broke, and I'm not a mechanic, okay? And if I rush out to the car store and buy all types of fancy gadgets to get my engine running again, and I go up under that engine, Okay, I can end up wasting those resources, wasting time, wasting my money, and if I'm not careful, I could probably get killed under that hood not knowing what I'm doing. I got to be patient. I got to get that manual. I got to read through it. I got to study that system so once I get under that hood, I know exactly what to do, when and where. Problem with black folk is nobody is patient enough to investigate the problem fully to make sure we understand it so when we go out to fix it, we don't lose any lives unnecessarily, any resources unnecessarily, any time or money unnecessarily. Black people have to understand, I had to say first stage, we're not going any place until we understand what we're dealing with. And this is the weakness of our position now. You know, people want to talk about a black agenda with no understanding, no in-depth understanding of what they're dealing with or being afraid to talk about racism, white supremacy as a total system dynamic. So that's step one, to understand what the game is all about. Step two is, I say, the self-respect factor. See, I have to respect myself at a sufficient level to want to push back the force that is attempting to destroy me. I can't want to integrate with it. We don't have a think tank, what is a, something I call a dark matter think tank. These Europeans got think tanks all over the place and that's how they always are 20 steps ahead of us. Because nobody is thinking and strategizing, we're just reacting. And that's why they're keeping us the way we are. We're reactors, you see. We are not supposed to be reactors. We are supposed to be actors, not reactors. We act upon things based upon a consensus thought. When we come together and we know the strategy, it's because all of the greater thinkers came together and threshed out this plan and we knew all of where it's going to fail, where it's not going to fail, how it's going to work, where it will work, where it will not work, and we move from that. We don't have that. That power is the ability to define someone's reality and have that person accept that definition as if it were their own. And we have allowed people to define us as to who we are and what we can do. And we have accepted that as if we thought that ourselves. So they don't want us to know how great we are because that's the missing link. If we really knew how great the potential that we have, and that's really all we have left. We have nothing left but our potential. And whenever that potential is able to get free, then we go to the top. They don't keep you out because you're the worst. They keep us out because we are the very best. If we go back to the 1980s, the 1980s, if you remember, there was a lot of focus around whether or not black men had a gene that predisposed them to violence. What's making black men kill other black men? Nobody said anything about slavery, the after effects, self-hate, miseducation, economic castration. Because I can tell you that miseducation and economic castration, that is the lack of jobs, is the mother and father of violence. If you don't educate me properly and you keep me from making a decent livelihood for me and my children, I have no choice but to go to the underworld to feed my family. And in the underworld, I'm likely to come face to face with somebody else who's trying to feed their family at my family's expense. It breeds the violence. And even if you're not selling drugs, the fact that you're walking around knowing as a man that you can provide for you and yours, which is a natural responsibility, it breeds the anger that we sooner or later let off on one another. And whenever you read a story about a black man killing another black man, they never give you the contextual relevance of what happened. You coming out of store, I'm walking in the store. I bump you accidentally, you turn around and you kill me. On the surface, I just like to look like a crazy, angry black man. Nobody's gonna tell you I got fired from a job yesterday for standing up to somebody who called me out my name. Nobody's gonna tell you that I've been putting in job applications for two years consistently, and as soon as they find out that I've been to prison, they drop me from the job. They don't put it in context. 75% of the violence that's taking place out there by black people is economically based. 
and nobody's dealing with it. Half the black men in Philadelphia, unemployed. Half the black men in Baltimore, unemployed. Half the black men in New York City, unemployed. But you don't want to tie that to the rise in violence? Everybody knows when there's, never, when there's never enough jobs in society, violence goes up, even amongst white folk. This is what sociologists study. This is the science of criminology. No jobs, violence. More jobs, less violence. You know this. But when it comes to black people, we don't want to put it in context because we are trying to do what? Exterminate the image. We're trying to get people to see black people as an unnecessary hindrance to the progress of humanity. If you end up with a critical mass of non-white people, all of whom, all over the planet, who have been oppressed by racism, white supremacy, if they begin to understand the white motivation, do you see, so they're no longer acting in a way that allows white supremacy to be maintained. Like black people, as long as we're killing each other, destroying ourselves, do you see, or say if you're learning, you're acting white, and so we don't want to do that. These are all dysfunctional behaviors. If we begin to really understand racism, white supremacy, what it is, how it works, it's not a question of you know, hating white people, that's a waste of energy and a waste of time, but we would no longer be behaving in a way that makes white supremacy comfortable to exist. So we keep talking about, you know, our mantra for over what, 75 years has been, we gotta have unity, we gotta have unity. No, we don't. We don't have to have unity with each other, we just need to get the same idea. And the other thing is that our educators can't decide on what is the history. That's a problem. If you get 10 of them in here in a room, all 10 of them will have a lot of differences about where the civilization started, what we did, who did it, and where, okay? White people agree on their history, even if it's a lie, they agree on it. Patrick Henry, they agree on that, you know, Marco Polo, whoever it is, they agree, yep, that's what he did. Yep, that's what he did. They don't have a, a, a argument about what the truth is. They just came together, decided on what the history is gonna be, and then that's what they accept it, and that's what they teach their children, and that's what they teach our children. And now what's, now instead of Ku Klux Klan, who do we have? We have the Tea Party. Because the Tea Party are the children of the immigrants that were brought here for those jobs. But as long as they did their jobs, it was all right. But now what are they doing? They are now outsourcing the jobs to India and to China and to South America. And now who's losing their jobs? Who's losing their homes? It's those poor, huddled masses that were brought here to Ellis Island. It's out, it's in source, outsource. And peoples of European descent never realized what the real problem was. Because they were ignorant enough to believe that it was black folk. White folk are in worse position because even black folk that got the job in McDonald's, got the job as custodians, they have a job now. It's those other ones that were given those middle management positions that have lost their jobs, lost their homes, lost their car, lost their way. Quite frankly, from what I'm hearing them say, they done lost their minds. And so we have men who don't have the discipline to withstand the onslaught of the sexual energy that our women now carry. Most of our women don't get along with a black man unless he laying down. Once y'all stand up, we going back to fighting but we get along with you in the bed. And I tell them, I say, we have to learn how to get along with our man more than just in the bed. And there has never been a civilization where the children grew up to be successful when the man and the woman were at odds with each other, like the black man and black woman in, in America, okay? The fact that we can't get along is demonstrative by the situation, the uh, condition of our children, especially our daughters. Our, our sons are acting like daughters, okay? They're not gay, they just have the feminine emotional mechanism because they've been around too many women and been raised by women and heard so much negative things about a black man, about being a black father. Food, clothing, and shelter. Until you get food, clothing, and shelter, you will never get the attention of the masses. What made Marcus Garvey so successful? What made the Honorable Elijah Muhammad so successful? What made the Black Panther Party so successful? Now you're looking at three different ideologies. Mr. Garvey's Pan-Africanism. Elijah Muhammad's black religious nationalism, the black socialism of the Black Panther Party. Ideologically, they were different, but all three of them did one thing, provided for food,
clothing, shelter, jobs, education, medical care. Every last one of those institutions attempted to build some sort of an independent functioning community with services. We ain't doing that today. We ain't doing that today. And that's why we don't have their attention. They say, why does the church continue to control black people when all they do is sell Jesus and collect money? Why? Because the church does have some services. It ain't sufficient, but they got more than the conscious organizations. The problem with the conscious organizations is all we do is run our damn mouth, but nobody's building. You follow me? We got a million and one books at the bookstore. We got a book for every problem, but the problems are still here. See, we have been content with the information. The information is not enough. It is information plus actions. That our schools teach our children the truth, okay? And we could do that because we pay for the schools. Public education is not free in that way. We pay for it every day, every time we pay taxes, every time we purchase things, every time we buy insurance, whatever it is, we're supporting all these things. And we have more say so there, but it's difficult to get us to come out to the schools. And the frustration of having children who are out of control is so high that the mothers are glad to send the child off to school and try to give that responsibility to somebody else instead of us taking that responsibility on ourselves. Because of the educational system, we are taught not to trust. And some people want to say it's the, the Willie Lynch syndrome. You know what I mean? Some people say that. But it's the trust factor with us. We don't look at each other as family anymore because we have been Europeanized, a lot of us, or Westernized. This gives us the impetus to be able to claim who we are as a people. And for us now to go into our schools and teach our children, because if we don't teach them this, look, if I were them, I wouldn't teach this. I'm telling you straight up right now. I would not teach African children to be, have power over themselves. If they have power over themselves, they don't have to ask you for a job. They don't have to depend on you for a job. They'll make their job. Black businesses are very important because the African-American people Black people in America are taught to just have good jobs, go to school and get a good job. Black people in America are not taught to start black businesses. Just like with colleges, most black colleges, if you notice, they'll have the initials A&M, Alabama A&M, North Carolina A&T. It's A&M and A&T, and those are, that's agricultural and mechanical, agricultural and technology. So those terms were used for black schools because black schools were, were training vehicles to get black people into the industrial revolution. It was trying to teach them how to be very good employees. We have to get out of that mindset of being good employees and learn how to take pride in, in being good business owners. We have to learn how to be more entrepreneurial. The solution is that we need to stop begging the job God to find work for us. The solution is that if black people are going to have work in America again, they're gonna have to bring back light manufacturing. We're gonna to have to create something. We're gonna to have to make something. And I'm telling you that there are other nations that would help us to do that because they want to see some real money come out of America instead of this fake dollar that's getting ready to go into a complete inflation. The solution is independence. Independent schools, anything we need for our survival, we must control. Independent farms, independent agriculture, independent airlines, independent shipping. We are the only people that don't invest in each other. We used to, but we don't do it anymore. So if you watch Asians, they always put money up for Toyota. Watch them. You see the Chinese right now, they have bus companies. They invest. This is what they do. The Italians do the same thing. We are the only ones that don't do that. And I'm encouraging black folk to set up consultant firms to teach Europeans how to survive in a depressed, inflated society. Because who better to teach them how to take a potato and feed the community potato soup. Who better than grandma that used to take a couple chicken wings and could feed the whole family? We have lived with an inflated dollar all of our life in America. We have lived in a depression all of our life in America. And yet, as Dr. Um, Maya Andrew says, still we rise. We're still able to smile. We're still able to relate to each other. That's a powerful thing. They need to learn this. After we saw Dr. King, and after we saw Malcolm get assassinated, Patrice Lumumba, Mega Evans, I mean the 60s, they tried to take care of everybody they could find. That put so much fear in subsequent black leadership that they are still cowards to this day. Which is why I say respectfully, there's not one of them who I could point a little black, a young black boy to and say, you know what, you should be like him when you grow up. Not one of them. Because the average black leader today is really not a black leader, he is a deal broker. The job of the black leader is to broker power deals between the structure, and the black masses. Let me give you an example. 
A riot's about to kick out outside. Cops beat down the brother. Brother's about to go and tear up the police district. The leader should do what? Come in, organize it. Say, hold on, brothers, before we go there, there's another way we can handle this thing. Let's do this, let's do this, let's do this. In other words, you organize the energy, you redirect it into a direction that is most likely to bring the desired result. They don't do that. They don't redirect the energy. You know what they do? They dissipate the energy. Go back home. Let the law prevail. Let's settle it on election day. You follow me? Let's get some plaque cards and march around the police district. Let's do something that don't mean a damn thing to white folks. This is what they do. Deal brokers. That's all they do. They send them in to dissipate the energy and send you home and you never hear about the incident again. These people who march are powerless. You don't march for what you want, you take what you want. Everybody knows that. The mafia knows that. You go and you take what you want. You take what you want, you establish your, uh, your, your superiority and your seniority over that and that's yours. You don't go marching for somebody to give you anything. That is insane and inane. We don't do that anymore. That's one thing we could at least learn. Don't go marching for a damn thing anymore. Take what you know is yours, work towards becoming better and understanding how your adversary works. Work towards understanding the tactics of your adversary. Read the art of war and read all things having to do with tactics, mental, psychological, as well as physical, as well as military. Understand the way that chess is played. Teach your children how to play chess because it has them working both sides of their brain. Know thyself. We have to know our history. We have to study. We have to study chemistry and physics and math. We have to learn how to write and read. We have to recapture our history. We have to make Medunete, or what we call hieroglyphs, the classical African language. We have to make Kiswahili the practical spoken language. So if I go to Brazil, and there's a brother that speaks Portuguese, or a sister that speaks Portuguese, I speak English, we should be able to speak Kiswahili to each other. If I go to Holland, there's a brother or sister that speaks Dutch, I speak English, we should be able to speak to each other in Kiswahili. Understanding the game and self-respect, meaning, you know, what is what's in my interest. It's not about hating anybody. It's what's in my interest. Like my ultimate goal objective is not hating white people, not wanting to do to white people what they have done to black and other people of color, but to replace the system of racism, white supremacy with a system of justice so that there can be peace on the planet. And to understand that we can do in the class what Michael Jordan did on the basketball court, what the Williams sisters did on the tennis court, and what our brother Tiger did on the golf course, we can rewrite the game. We can make it so that they can't test us because they're not intelligent enough to ask the kind of questions that we would answer. This is how deep we are. And they know this. And like I say, this has been my theme. If I were them, I would do the same thing. How can I let you out? What's gonna happen to me when you find out who you are? I will be destroyed. One thing that we could say about African peoples is that we left evidence of ourselves all over this planet. And that's the problem with European scientists. The deeper they dig, the blacker the planet gets. And what we have been made to see now is this infusion of European, uh, I guess, philosophies about what the past was, and no one else on TV is actually giving us evidence of what we were, who we were, but Europeans. Every person has the right to know their ancestral history. Every person, no matter where they are in the world. Most of world history, 90% of world history is African history. 
And even that 10% Africa is extraordinarily involved in making it what it is. You won't find a painting. You won't find a statue. You won't find a monument anywhere prior to 1500 that isn't Africoid in some way, shape, or form. don't have a problem. White folk got a problem. Black folk problem is that white folk got a problem. The real problem we have is white supremacy. The real problem we have is the perception people have of us. From 1790 up until 1965, your immigration laws played almost zero for black folk. You had a zero immigration law for black folk. Because you're, you're destined to be a planned minority. You know what a minority means? That means a loser. That means you're a loser. It's very difficult to control a group of people militarily because eventually the money will run out if you try to control a group of people militarily. And also the, the possibility of them raising up against you is always imminent. So it's best to control a people psychologically. When you conquer a people, you have two choices. One, you have to commit an act of genocide. Either you wipe them out completely, complete act of genocide so that you can take over the resources of the land. Or you kill the warrior class of, this, of these people and you enslave the children and the elderly. This is just war history. In our situation, meaning those that live in the United States, the choice was enslavement, not genocide. That means that from a child, you have to be taught that everything about you is wrong. Everything about who you were and where you came from is wrong. And I mean wrong, immoral and illegal. Melanin is a neurochemical that is produced in part through the pituitary and the pineal gland. They both play a central role in the production of melanin, which is ultimately responsible for the color that we have in our skin. Now, historically, it had always been thought that melanin played a significant role in the intellectual propensity of African people. For example, when you study some of the Greek writings on melanin, or the color of Africans, many of the Greek philosophers believed that that melanin played some sort of a role in how Africans had been able to create and develop some of the sciences that they had come to be known for. So melanin was always considered an intellectual sort of a chemical. The pineal gland which produces melanin, it's shaped like a pine cone. And the origin of the word pineal literally means resembling a pine cone. Now, in ancient symbolisms, the pine cone has always been represented because people knew the importance of the pineal gland as it related to melanin and the universe. Melanin is a molecule. And the concept of melanin is, it, it, it is black in its nature. And we find it in the cosmos, we find it in the heavens. We find it in water, we find it in land, we find it in everything that exists. The sperm of the, of the male and the egg of the woman, they're both layered with melanin. So that when the sperm penetrates the egg, there is a melanin explosion. And that melanin helps to uh, formulate uh, the fetus within that egg. And that fetus is literally coated with the melanin substance. That melanin substance then goes on to form the brain and the central nervous system. So every human being begins with a melanin explosion. Melanin is an intelligence. It's an intelligence because it is the dynamic, the primary dynamic in every part of the cell. It's a primary dynamic in the core of the human being as well as to the surface of the human being. Its intelligence is responsible for the forming of the nervous system. Every part of the nervous system has these little black dots all through it, which essentially carry information. 
So melanin, from, um, from a uh, physical standpoint, is, is that substance that accounts for what black people refer to as soul. We move differently, we walk differently, we talk differently because we have access to a different form of energy than other folk. Not only is melanin a pigment, which is so obvious, but melanin as an intelligence is a communications module that essentially broadcasts as well as receives information by way of light and sound frequency signatures. Scholars and scientists have been having conferences about melanin, uh, to my awareness, at least since the 1920s. The pineal glands of most of our white brothers and sisters are calcified, and so they make less melanin. And that comes from the historical relationship to what we call the Wormian Ice Age, that 10,000 years of glacial freezing that happened in Europe after the Africans who were the Grimaldi moved up there. And so it became the survival of the fittest who was able to adapt could survive, who wasn't able to adapt died. So those people who were able to get rid of their melanin was able to survive. Those who could not get rid of the melanin, they died. These scientists said that um, uh, the pineal gland, they refer to the pineal gland as a vestigial organ. That is a calcified gland within the body that served no purpose, as if the creator would create something that, that you didn't need. And it was only after uh, the Vietnam War, uh, in, the, in the late 60s and early 70s, that they began to rewrite their interpretation of the pineal gland. The reason for that was that um, a large number of, of African Americans fought and died during the Vietnam War. And uh, whenever a soldier dies, uh, there's an autopsy that's performed before their body is sent back to Dover Air Force Base. And what they discovered, what these physicians discovered, is that when they performed the autopsies, the 75 to 80 percent of the African American soldiers had a large functioning pineal gland. The pineal gland is normally about the size of your thumb. So it was not a vestigial organ in 70 to 80 percent of African Americans, but it is a calcified organ in 75 to 80 percent of people with European ancestry. So they began to reevaluate the pineal gland, they began to reevaluate melanin. I think if you talk to Dr. Welsing, she'll tell you this is about genetic annihilation or genetic survival, okay? It's about genetics. Who will survive America? Who will survive the world? Whose genetics will hold up? What, what is going to be the, genetic, or the genotype that's on the planet a thousand years from now? Will it be white? Will it be brown? Will it be black? And so you find that the elements of the human family that find themselves suffering from the ecology that we're in they're struggling to survive and to be able to maintain themselves. All nations, European nations and America, white Americans, are at minus birth rate right now. Not zero birth rate, where they're keeping up with the natural death. They're at minus birth rate. And so that's why there's so much emphasis on artificial birth creation and other ways to have babies and make babies that are beyond the, the normal. And you'll also find that this adopting black babies the Haiti thing, the getting the children out of the Central African Republic and Chad, um, adopting Filipino babies, Latino babies by the white community on such a high level it is to infuse their gene pool with the melanin. A few years ago, the president of Chad, a man by the name of Idris Deby, he had a group of French charity workers arrested after it was found out that they were kidnapping children from that area. Now, Debbie accused them of stealing the children from their parents and planning to sell the children to pedophile rings up in Europe. He also accused them of possibly planning to kill the children to sell their organs. Now, this is the president of Chad saying this, and this was a big scandal with the Chadian government and the French government. So we need to understand everything that's going on with people going into Africa trying to get these children up out of here. There's a war being waged on melanated people, and melanated people, people of color, should realize that a war is going on. A lot of melanated people do not realize that this war is going on. And this war is going on on an educational front. There's a spiritual warfare. 
There's a medical warfare, there's a prison industrial warfare, and there's an economic warfare being imposed on people of color, especially in America. If you want to convince a group of people that everything about them is negative, what you have to do is tell them where they're from is a negative place. And this is what they've done to black people. They say, black people, you're negative, you're bad, because Africa is negative, and Africa is bad. So the images that we have of Africa, we always see the underbelly. We always see the propaganda. We always see the warfare, but they never show the other side. One of the things that, that I've discovered about conquered people is that most conquered people have had their ancestral memory erased. And they only know what missionaries or enslavers have taught them. And usually, it's negative. There is good, there is bad, there is advancement, and, and there is a lack of advancement in all cultures. The problem is that this society tends to want to show you the, 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 the extended belly of a baby in Ethiopia. It wants to show you the negativity of Africa. People think Africa and, and Asia and uh, Guatemala, Southern America, these places were all jungle. Jungle came after the invasions of, of European colonialism. Then the jungles came in because nobody was manning the land anymore. Look at the map. Just this map tells you alone that the great majority of Africa is grassland. It shows you right here. It's grassland. No jungle. In fact, the Everglades, by proportion, there's more jungle in the Everglades than there is proportionately in Africa. And that's in Florida. There's more jungle in Europe and in Asia than there is in Africa. Without a doubt, Africa has its wetlands, it has its greenery, uh, some of the most beautiful animal and animal kingdoms in the world. But most of Africa is not jungle. There's more jungle on the other continents than there is in Africa. In fact, you have vast uh, 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 vast greenlands in Africa, miles, tens of thousands of miles of nothing but flat, beautiful green land. Whenever they show images of Africa, they like to show the hunter-gatherers, the bushmen, the brothers running around half-naked with sticks. And that really represents about 1% of the whole population of Africa. Um, as a matter of fact, you have those same hunter-gatherer people up in Europe. There's a group of people called the Sami people who live just like that, who live in mud huts, and they live that hunter-gatherer experience. But you never see any kind of mention of them in the media. You only see the African Bushmen, but you never see the rest of the whole continent and, and see how people are really living over there. Whenever you look at old Tarzan movies, old cartoons from back in the 1920s and 30s, they would always show the cannibalistic African person dancing around in the jungle with a big pot, putting in missionaries, cooking them and eating them. And that's a major myth about Africa because there is no evidence of any kind of cannibalism going on in Africa. There is no evidence of cannibalism in Africa. In fact, if you read a book called Man Eater, there's more references to Europeans eating each other in the cold than there is Africans eating each other in the warm. Why are you going to have a need to eat each other when the Creator and the Sun has given you mango and peanuts and food to eat that comes to you plentifully? There's no evidence of it, but again, to denigrate Africa and Africans, they have to create an image that people are going to shy away from. There's so many fallacies about African people and African history and culture. Uh, and, and cannibalism is, is, is one example. Uh, you know, based on, based on my study, uh, I found more evidence of cannibalism um, practiced among Europeans in Virginia in the 1600s. There are documented cases of the first settlers coming to uh, Virginia from England coming here in fall and in the dead of winter and not having enough supplies to see them through through that season. So there's documented instances of, of people exhuming the bodies of the dead and eating them. There's, docu there's, there's one particular instance, instance I forget the, the, the gentleman's name, but actually I read this in a National Geographic uh, magazine about a man whose wife died and he kept her death a secret so that he could eat her corpse 
and survive the winter. The cannibalism was going on in Europe big time. There's a lot of evidence showing the, the cannibalism that was going on in Europe. As a matter of fact, this whole vampire phenomenon that we have is rooted in the cannibalism that was going on in Europe in the Middle Ages. One of the most famous vampires, Dracula, Count Dracula, is really based on a real person named Vlad Dracula, who's also known as Vlad the Impaler. And there's a very famous uh, portrait of Vlad the Impaler from around 1499, sometime in the 1400s, showing him and these people that he impaled on the stake. But they only show half of this portrait because when you pan out of this portrait, you will see Vlad the Impaler literally at a dinner table eating the body parts. And I mean, he has like knife, fork, salt and pepper, like he's that Applebee's or Denny's or something. You have to remember at the time, Isabella or the queen at the time put a bounty on slaves. And part of the edict that she uh, sent out was anyone or any of the people that you catch who are cannibals, you can enslave them. So now everybody would say, okay, they were cannibals. Another myth about Africa is that it's extremely violent. Whenever we see anything about Africa, especially movies and the news, we always see the African warlord. We always see the, the African rebels riding on trucks, the African rebels with rocket launchers and, and machine guns. So what they do, the Western media, they'll take footage of a war-torn area. And the footage might even be old. They'll get old footage and show war-torn areas of Africa. They did that with the Coney 2012 propaganda not too long ago. And they'll try to pretend that this is what all of Africa is like. But in reality, out of the top 10 countries around the world with the lowest violent crime rates, six of those countries are in Africa, like Senegal, Cameroon, Mali, a lot of people don't know that. In an attempt for Western powers and, and European historians to distance Africa from Egypt, because they, they, they try to pretend that Egypt and the rest of Africa is totally different. So what they did, they created something called the Sub-Saharan African, meaning that the Africans below the Sahara Desert were somehow disconnected from the Africans in the North. Africans have always interacted with, the, with each other all over Africa. Africans have always moved around Africa. Um, even the Sahara Desert, it was not always a desert, number one. Number two, the Nile River goes from North Africa right into Southern Africa. So if they wanted to go back and forth from North Africa to Southern Africa, they can just take the Nile River. Now, one of the things we have to be concerned about is the concerted effort to take Egypt out of Africa. And so many times when people speak of Africa, they exclude Egypt. And I think, and many people I think would agree with me, many of my colleagues and contemporaries, they would say that excluding Egypt from Africa would be like taking Greece and Rome out of Europe. It's just a huge void. The more south you go, the more uh, African-centered you'll get. As, as you move more north, their, their attachment to those structures are, are just not there. There's a lot of reasons why that happens, just in terms of they know it's not them. They know it's not their mindset. They know that they want to exploit it, but they do not know it. It is not part of them. They are an invading force. For them to be in Egypt today is equivalent to Europeans claiming America of 3,000 years ago. And they could care less about those temples because number one, they didn't build them. And from an Islamic perspective, they really wouldn't like to see them in existence. The reason they're there is because they are a money maker for the Egyptian government. Let's be clear. A lot of the Egyptians that are there in Egypt now, they, they're invaders. They came later on down the line. They're not the ancient Egyptians. They're not connected to the ancient Egyptians, and they know that. When they're over there, they don't respect the ancient monuments as their own. Like when you go to the mosque over there, they respect the mosque. They, they're not over there smoking cigarettes. They're not selling things in front of the mosque. But when you go to the pyramids and you go to the museums, um, you go to the Sphinx, people, they're out there hustling. They're out there trying to sell you things. They're smoking cigarettes. They're out there running scams. They're running game on you. Right. Can you see this picture? We know this picture? Yes. Yeah. Well, let me see that. What was that? Hold on. Mr. Obama. Uh, That's Barack Obama? Obama was my father. Barack Obama was your father? Yeah, in the panorama place. Oh
then we believe that. When the white scientists go into the temples of Kemet to excavate and clean up the walls and temples and make them visible and inhabitable, they are changing the color of the actual paintings of the Africans on the wall. There was an entire report that came out how the scientific excavators in the temples of Kemet were lightening up the images on the wall, the Medu Netcher. So you have black images and they're using chemicals that actually turn the black image tan. Professor Smalls told me when he went to study over there, he said the reason why we over here in the West are so caught up with ancient Kemet is because the seeds of Kemet after Kemet was destroyed all were driven to the south and to the west of Africa. And during the time of the slave trade, the strangers were the ones that they gave up first. So the people who actually are the ones that were brought over here were the remnants from ancient Kemet. They too, the people of Mali and the people of these areas that you're seeing with the Dogon, they say that the Dogons themselves are the forgotten parts of those tribes that actually ended up uh, or who were driven out of ancient Kemet. The Dogon were a group of Africans from the West Coast who had in fact been able to achieve a degree of astrological superiority and dominance that we really don't see a contemporary for or precedent for other than what was achieved in Navali civilization. And people began to uh, chase the Dogon to examine them because you couldn't figure out how these so-called primitive Africans would have knowledge of, um, of astronomy, particularly the white dwarf star Sirius B that Western astronomy itself is only coming to grips with. And so the Dogon have developed a kind of, um, um, I almost said infamy in, in, in the world. In fact, there's even a book called The Serious Mystery. And it's about how the Dogon, these primitive Africans, could have knowledge of a star system that's invisible to the naked eye. So the Dogon are black people in Mali with an astronomical lore. Whenever we see people in Africa, we always see the AIDS-infested African babies, the African people. But what they do not talk about is the AIDS that's going on in Europe. Most people don't know that most of the new AIDS cases today are not in Africa. Most of the new AIDS cases today are coming out of Eastern Europe, out of Russia, the Ukraine, and there's an AIDS epidemic over there in that area, but you never hear about it in the media. Nations are invaded at the end of their power. If you look at all of the great nations that rose, when nations are invaded, they are the nation itself is sick already. Only dying nations are invaded. Nations act like animals to each other. If the state is strong, which means it is in a constant state of war. It is continuously fending off when it doesn't, well, and not war always shooting and killing. Commerce wars, trade wars, competitions, even sports. S the state is always in a constant push off, push off, push off, and, and let in. We want this acquisition. We want that. We want that. We going to take that give and take. When another state starts to get weak because its people are unskilled, becomes ignorant, betray the king or queen or the, or the, the, the ruling class, or the ruling class becomes tyrant and the people can't control the people anymore, any of these things, you lose your resources, just your state starts to deteriorate. The minute your state starts to deteriorate, other states are looking at you. It ain't got nothing to do with we love you, we knew you, we know your family. As a matter of fact, we'll take you in. You can you go into exile and come on into our state and come on in, but we take in your land, your resources. Why? Because you're weak. How can Africa be so poor and yet be materially so rich? It's real simple. The answer lies in the structural adjustment programs 
SAP, the structural adjustment programs that are imposed on African nations by the International Monetary Fund of Washington, D.C., the World Bank of Washington, D.C., and USAID. These three organizations come into Africa, loan money, and then charge an interest rate on that money that they know the African nations can never pay back, thusly re-enslaving the entire nation and, in fact, the entire continent. I point out that when Spanish, English, Dutch explorers would, would, would go through, let's say, the Americas, because a good example here for the African uh, continent, many of the places they arrived at were already abandoned. Our tribes' leaders, our, our kings and queens, our priests, traveled the world. They were literate. They read and spoke many languages. They heard and knew. These guys are coming to take over the land. They got weird weapons, and this is what they're going to do. They went back to their tribe, told everybody, gather up your stuff. We have to leave. There is an invading force coming. We have to go. So many tribes were warned. When this invading force came, many times they came and found the place deserted and just claimed it as their own. Why was Muammar Gaddafi killed? Muammar Gaddafi was murdered because he, along with the other African heads of state, were about to bring into existence Africa's first central bank. They were erecting a central bank in Africa, which was going to do what? Back its money to the resources under the ground in Africa. Now, what would that have done to the global economic order? Remember, the United States dollar isn't backed on any natural resource. The British pound isn't backed on any natural natural resource. Uh, the Canadian dollar, the European Union, their currency isn't backed on any natural resource because Europe doesn't have a lot of natural resources. Africa does. So if they would have been successful in creating a central bank of Africa, coming up with a unitary currency, and then backing that currency to the material wealth under the soil, they would have bankrupt every other economic system in this world from America to Europe to China. That was revolution. And that's why Muammar Gaddafi had to be assassinated because he was about to help the African heads of state eliminate modern slavery and neocolonialism from the continent. One of the things that you find is that European culture begins to take off after uh, the first civilized Europeans, the Greeks, make contact with Kemet or Egypt. Greeks themselves were not white people, and even today, you ain't Greek. I, I was in the military. I was stationed in Athens and Piraeus. We know we're cousins. Let's stop playing. We still have black Greeks living in Greece right now to this day, and people pretend they don't know where they came from, but they're black Greek people living in Greece right now. People of Ireland long before, and the people of Scotland long before the Romans came, were already African peoples. Why you, if you see a picture of a Scottish person, there's always somebody with like this real thick black hair, right? And this real thick black, what do you think they're trying to tell you? You know, they came out with a report a few years ago saying that King Tut shared DNA with men up in Britain. And the thing is, the Egyptians went into Britain particularly Scotland, later on down the line. As a matter of fact, Scotland is named after an Egyptian princess, Scotia. And many of the descendants of those Egyptians are there to this day, but they're now known as gypsies. And the term gypsy is just a variation of the word Egyptian. Whites have long hair, blacks have short curly hair. What is the reason for that? Black's hair, your follicle, my follicle is not round. It's flat, like a ribbon. So you know how Christmas you rub your hand on the ribbon and it curls up? Well, that's the way our hair do. White hair is like a soda straw. It's round, so it hangs. What is the purpose for that? All of the main um, arteries 
that take the messages and information from the brain to the rest of the body pass through the human neck. So if you're caught in an ice age, you've got to grow enough hair to shield the neck, to insulate the neck. Otherwise, you're gonna die. Same thing with the nostrils. When you're in the sun of Africa, you need these big nostrils we have because you gotta cool the brain down. But if you're in Europe, in all that ice, you don't want to cool the brain down. So you need a smaller nostril bridge so you can warm the air up that's coming in. These simple physical anthropological realities. The Greeks lost their history, all of it. <laughs> okay, the Greeks lost all their history. You know who had their history? The Arabs had the Greeks' history. The reason we know Greek history is because of Islam. Because of the Arabs, the Arabs revered Greek history. And what the Greeks were doing and all their philosophies, they wrote it all down. Then Greece lost their history through wars and this and that and the other. And they regained their history because of Arabic texts. Oh, thank heaven for 7-Eleven. Oh, thank heaven for 7-Eleven. What's 7-Eleven? 7-Eleven was when the Moors, Africans, from, um, from Morocco, which is where the, the word Moor comes from, but Africans from Northern Africa uh, went across the Iberian Peninsula, which is a very short distance, into Europe. And they brought culture, they brought writing, they brought civilization, and they brought Europe out of the Dark Ages. It was the, the, the Romans that began to call the black people in Africa. Because remember that day, we didn't speak English. So if you don't speak English, you're not going to call yourself black, right? So if you don't speak a traditional African language or Portuguese or Spanish, you will not call yourself Negro. At that time, Spanish was not dominant, so there's no Negro, there's no Portuguese. At that time, English is not dominant, so there's no black. There's at that time, the Romans were the dominant force, and the Roman word for black persons was Maurice, coming from the Greek roots for black. They occupied Portugal. They occupied um, uh, parts of southern France. Up until 1700s, all the medical books on surgery and general medicine in Europe was written in Arabic. Isn't that extraordinary? All of the major universities of Europe, where the physicians and the scientists and the teachers were all studying, was in Spain and Portugal, run by the Africans that the West call Moors. And the reason the West keep emphasizing them as Moors, they don't want you to see that this is the same African we got enslaved that gave us all the wealth of knowledge that allow us to enslave you. At this time in Europe, we're talking the early 8th century, most European kings and queens could neither read or write. The Moors build vast libraries. Any, anybody, irrespective of your religion, you could practice your religious faith, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, in relative freedom. We find uh, Moors in the uh, army of the Spanish emperor Trajan. In fact, in Italy, you have what's called Trajan's Column, and you can see more clearly more soldiers on horseback on that column. You can go to Rome and see it for yourself. You have at least one emperor in Rome of Moorish ancestry. His name is Macrinus. He's specifically described as a Moor. You have other high-ranking Moors in the Roman army. The Moors were known for building castles all throughout Europe, and some of those same castles can actually be found around North Africa. They call them desert castles or kazirs, but they are castles all around Africa. The heart and soul, the thought, the mind that built the castles came from Africa. And they went through Europe and they built them. They built them straight through Spain, straight through Portugal, going up into France, going up into other parts of the world. The earliest examples of castle building I found in an area that is now known as Nubia. Uh, if you were to go to the Nubia Museum in Aswan, Egypt, you'll find a model of a castle complete with a moat, drawbridge, fortifications, all of the architectural elements that we associate with castles in any part of Europe existed in Africa as late as 1800 BC, before there was civilization in Europe. The Moors are described in English literature or European literature as black as pitch, black as a crow, black as a raven, black as ink, nothing white about them but their teeth. 
The monument that we know is Stonehenge. A European writer by the name of Gerald Massey said in one of his books that Stonehenge was built by an African man named Morian. Now this is from a European writer because a lot of times when, when black historians say something like this, it's, been, it's written off as being Afrocentric. But European writers and several other European writers say that African people built Stonehenge and other monuments up in Europe. Only when the enslavement of Africans started to produce wealth for Europe that this notion of color racism began to become a reality. Most of the great saints of Europe are black. Almost every church in Europe have a black Madonna and child. Saint Calagero was another patron saint of Italy. He was a black man, and there's black statues of this man all over Italy, and there's paintings of Saint Calagero all over Italy and Sicily. They worship this man in Sicily. They still have statues of many Moors up in Europe today. They have a statue of Saint Benedict that was made in the 1700s. There's another bust carving of Saint Gregory that's in a museum in Germany. So there's statues of Moors and African people all over Europe to this day that you can see, but you gotta go to museums to see them. They're very quiet about them. You have to go over there. And also you have to um, learn about these things in different languages because they keep that history hidden because they'll put it in another language. The Ivory Bengal Lady was an African woman whose tomb they found up in the York area of Britain. Now, whenever they find African people in Britain, what they would normally do is just try to write them off as being slaves, or they might have been a slave. It's a possibility that they were slaves. But with the Ivory Bengal lady, they couldn't write her off as a slave because it showed that she had so much wealth, she could not have possibly been a slave. The way her tomb was made, it was made out of stone, which showed wealth. Inside the tomb, it had all types of artifacts and jewelry, like ivory bangles and necklaces and, and bracelets on her wrists and it showed that this woman was extremely wealthy. Johannes Morris was a 13th century high-ranking official in Italy, and there's a, a carving, a statue of him at a museum in Italy right now, and the statue of Johannes Morris shows his clearly African features, African nose, African lips, African hair. Look at the countries that are falling. Almost by chronology, they're falling the same way they invaded Africa. Greece is falling, Italy is falling, Spain is falling, Persia is falling. And it's all because what goes around comes around. No hocus pocus, no mumbo jumbo, this is just the way it is. You shall reap what you sow. That's not a biblical term, that's a scientific term. When you read the European philosophers, what did they say? They often said that Africa had two great civilizations, Egypt in the north and Asia in the south. The white man said this. So they often, in, in ancient times, Asia was considered a part of Africa or Africa's second civilization. They said that you go to Asia and it's nothing but a carbon copy of Africa because it was settled by the Africans. A lot of people don't know that there are pyramids all over Asia and there are pyramids in, in China in Japan, they have an underwater pyramid that a lot of people don't know about, and you can go there now, and that's one of those ancient mysteries, but again, pyramids are all over the planet. So in, in Asia today, you have pockets of black people. You have the money. You have in southern Thailand, you have a related group in northern Malaysia, sometimes called Sakai, S-E-K-A-I. You have the Andaman Islanders, and there are at least two groups. One group is called the Onje, O-N-G-E, or O-N-J-E, -E, I think it's O-N-G-E, and another is called the Jawara, J-A-R-A-W-A. -A -A. And then you have black populations in the Philippines, sometimes called Negritos, or Eta, or I think we should call them Octa, which just means the people. You have a tradition of a similar group in Taiwan. These are the diminutive Africoids. These are the small blacks, similar in many ways to the Twa or so-called pygmies in Central Africa. These are very, very ancient people who left Africa perhaps 60, 70, maybe 100,000 years ago and became isolated. The Padong people, that's a group of people in Asia. And they, the women have these rings that they wear on their necks 
that's identical to an African tribe of women in East Africa who wear the same type of rings on their necks. So this just shows that the African-Asian connection is still there. They still carry on some of the African cultures and traditions in certain parts of Asia. I once had a professor of mine working on my doctorate tell me that she went to Japan and they went into the mountains of Japan. Now this isn't a conscious woman uh, by most definitions, but she couldn't wait to come back and tell me this. She said, Umar, I was in Japan. We went up into the spiritual temples of Japan and we sat down in one of the temples waiting for the priest to come out and teach us a little bit about what they believe and what they stand for. She said, Umar, they walked out of the temples and their skin was just as black as ours. They had gray afros because they were elders. Now she said the phenotype looked like the modern uh, Asian, but she said the skin was black and they had gray afros, hair standing up on top like Don King. And she said it totally overcame me. They sat down and they began to talk. And she said, I couldn't believe these were black men. They were Japanese, but they were black men. When I went over to Indonesia, I went there at night and I would see billboards of very light-skinned Asian Indonesian people. And then when I went to my hotel, I would go and watch these movies and I would see these very, again, light-skinned, pale-skinned Indonesian Asian people. But the next day when I went out into the streets of Indonesia, everybody was either my color or darker. I didn't see one person who looked like these people that were on the billboards and on television. So they would pick and choose and get the whitest looking Asian people to promote in the media over there. And when I walked around Indonesia, I saw people like jet black, dark. I ran into a couple of people with afros. I, I saw one Asian brother, full blooded Asian guy with an afro and I had to stop him. I said, brother, where are you from? And the brother was like, I'm, I'm from here, right here in Indonesia. So that African presence, that African phenotype is still throughout Asia to this day. Look at the Buddha's hair. No Chinese person's hair look like that. The Buddha has knotty hair. Every time you see the Buddha, his hair is knotted. Just a thought. There's a painting called the Nambam painting of the Portuguese when they first go over to Japan. And when you look at this painting, the painting was made in around sometime in the 1500s, and it was the first eyewitness account of what they saw. Many of the Asian people there were dark skinned, and half the people who were supposed to be Portuguese were dark skinned. There's a tradition begun by a man named Alexander Francis Chamberlain, at least in April 1914, in a publication called the Journal of Race Development. And I can quote him almost exactly. And he says, and even in far off Japan, we can find traces of the ancient Negro. For when the Japanese armies in the eighth century, now here I'm paraphrasing, when the Japanese armies in the eighth century were fighting their traditional enemy, the Ainu, they were led by a famous Negro general named Sakanoye Tomomoraro. And this man became the first shogun in uh, Japanese history. Also in Malaysia, when I went down to Malaysia, I went into the rainforest over there. And it's very difficult to get over to some of these spots. Some of these people there are very secluded. And because they're secluded, they were able to avoid many natural disasters and they were also able to avoid invasions. So they didn't mix in with some of the invading forces. So they kept their same African phenotype. And if you go to Malaysia, there's a tribe called the Batek tribe. And they look like an African tribe. If you go there, they have woolly hair, African nose, lips, everything about these people look like, looks like an African tribe. One of the things we know about white supremacy and light skin supremacy, because even when you look at Asia, even when you go to East India, they practice racism. Why? Because all of these places were colonized by the European and their culture infected the people. So one of the things that they do is they also have a tendency to do what? Hide the darker brother. As a matter of fact, there was an incident that happened with Miss Fiji. Um, they had the Miss World competition, and they chose this woman to be Miss Fiji. And Miss Fiji has more Europeanized features. 
and the people of Fiji spoke out against her. They weren't really trying to hate on her, but they said, look, this woman doesn't represent us. She doesn't look like us. She doesn't have our nose. She doesn't have our hair. And we're very proud of what we look like, and we want somebody to represent us. Because again, they were trying to use that Europeanized Miss Fiji to bring in tourism and not scare away tourists. But the people spoke out against her. And this just shows that many people around the world, they're proud of their Apricoid features. One of the oldest groups of people to inhabit India were a group of black-skinned people called the Dravidians, or the Untouchables. Now, when people think about the history and the culture of India, they oftentimes think of Mahatma Gandhi. And many people give praises and accolades to Mahatma Gandhi because of Dr. Martin Luther King. But what many people do not know is that Gandhi had very racist views towards black people. The truth behind Mahatma Gandhi First of all, I'm reluctant to use the word Mahatma. Mahatma means great soul. And many of my Indian colleagues would say he wasn't even an ordinary soul, much less a great soul. The late great Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. put that picture of Mahatma Gandhi up in his office and said that he got the operational technique for nonviolence from Mahatma Gandhi. It was somewhat premature for the ancestor. Uh, who's one of my favorites, but it was premature because now you automatically set the stage where African people would start looking to Mahatma Gandhi also. For example, last spring, last Black History Month, I was in Atlanta. I went to the Dr. Martin Luther King Shrine where he and Queen Mother Coretti, Coretta are buried, and across the street is a museum. Outside the museum is a lifestyle statue of Mahatma Gandhi. I couldn't believe it. This is a museum dedicated to the honor of Dr. King. But there's no statue of Dr. King outside of a museum erected in his honor. Instead, you have a life-size statue of Mahatma Gandhi. So the message to the child is what? That it was really Mahatma Gandhi who's responsible for you coming through the civil rights struggle, not Dr. King. Now, had Dr. King knew Mahatma Gandhi's true racist thinking and ideology, I'm sure he would have thought otherwise. As a psychologist, you can never know how what's really at the root of somebody's thinking. I would argue that we should never make a hero of any other people. Mahatma Gandhi turned his back on Africans. Even when he came back to India and began fighting, he refused to give support to the African emancipation movements. And on more than one occasion, he had made derogatory remarks about Africans. And we also know the Dravidians of India. The Africans of India who are oppressed, were oppressed, and have always been oppressed in India. There is no record anywhere of Mahatma Gandhi fighting against the oppression of Indians in India who were black, the so-called Dravidians. Why didn't he speak out for them? Why didn't he speak out for, for Africans who were fighting against colonialism? Why didn't Mahatma Gandhi help our brothers and sisters in South Africa? It's because he was a racist like the rest of them. First of all, Australia itself is the world's second smallest continent, second only after Antarctica. Um, it's the smallest inhabited continent. The name Australia means Great South Land. And the first people of Australia were the people we call Aboriginal Australians, commonly called black fellas. And of course, you have different names, the Koori, the Guri, the Noonga, and various names. The people of Australia, originally Australia was an African land. In fact, in European documentation, they considered it an African satellite. When they came, when the British came into Australia and began the mass extermination of African people, they were crystal clear who they were exterminating because they said it. And, um, and also we know that right off the coast of Australia was an island called Tasmania, a little island off the coast of Tasmania. There are no living Tasmanians in existence right now. You can't find a Tasmanian man, woman, or child because the British systematically exterminated the entire population. <laughs> It wasn't until January 1967 that the Aboriginal people in Australia were considered humans for the first time. In January 1967, there was a national referendum to decide that Aboriginal Australians should have Australian citizenship. 
Up to that point, they were officially, and you can document this, classified as flora and fauna and plants and animals. In Australia, they would literally breed out the melanin of the people. You know, they would have these, they would take the children and take them to breeding camps and breeding farms and breed the darker ones and the mulatto ones with white. And they would literally breed the melanin out of these people. The movie Rabbit Proof Fence is about that breeding process, them breeding out the melanin of the Aboriginal people. So it was very deep what was going on over there. You have three major island chains, North Pacific, West Pacific, and South Pacific, Me Melanesia, Polynesia, Micronesia. Melanesia is the South Pacific. Those are, that means the black islands. And the biggest island is New Guinea. Others include New Caledonia, New Ireland, New Britain, um, Fiji, um, the Solomon Islands, Vanuatu, which used to be known as New Hebrides. These are the black islands. And the people that I've encountered um, in this part of the world tend to say they come from Africa. People tend to have very, very Africoid features, dark skin, uh, tightly curled hair, you know, large Afros, we call them today. Many of them say they come from Africa, especially in Fiji. And also in Buka Island. And I ask the people, where, where do you come from? We come from Africa. And they're very matter of fact about it. Buka, B-U-K, means black skin. And they have the reputation of being the blackest human beings on earth. So quite naturally, that was where I wanted to lay my head. at images of King Kamehameha, and I know you have, the, who is the, what might be considered the founder of Hawaii. It's like the founding father of Hawaii. Clearly, clearly Africa. One of the most famous Hawaiians is a guy named Duke Kahanamoku. Um, Duke was one of the forefathers of modern surfing, and they would use Duke to promote tourism in Hawaii. Um, they would send Duke to the continental United States to promote swimming in Hawaii and surfing, and Duke had problems getting into swimming areas when he came to the continental U.S. because people thought that he was black because he was so dark, and many of the native Hawaiians, they have that dark, African phenotype. If you go to places like Maui and some of the remote areas of Hawaii, you s they look like black people, just like Samoans. You go to Samoa, they look like black people over here in America. I was, I'm doing an interview, a call-in thing, and somebody called in and says, you know, I'm a Hawaiian. And he says, the problem was you just didn't meet the right people. I said, really? He says, when I was a young boy, my grandmother used to tell me that when Kamehameha was trying to unite the Hawaiian Islands, this is around 1815, that he ran into trouble and he sent back to Africa for reinforcements. He said that was a Hawaiian tradition. African people, they've been coming to the Americas for years, years, thousands of years before Europeans. And this is why many Europeans knew how to get over to the Americas based on maps that African people left for, for centuries. We wear the gene pool of the Native American population. We wear the gene pool of the African, which is called Moors, who had preceded Columbus to this country. And we wear the gene pool of those Africans who came from the continent. And so we felt that this land, and I do now still feel this land is ours. I'm an African American. Africa is my race, America is my geopolitical place. I'm not surrendering that to anybody. One of the things we know is there are Europeans who wrote books about the African presence in America before Columbus. 
but it's difficult to actually get your hands on some of the copies of these books. They're real hard to find because it wasn't popular for white folk or black folk, but especially white scientists to say that African folk, that Moorish people were in America prior to the European coming here. There are three belts that leave the coast of Africa. There's one that's in the north, there's one in the middle, and there's one in the south. When you look at this middle one, this middle one literally will take you right into the Gulf of Mexico, even, even if you don't have power, boat. And what's gonna happen is Africans are gonna start to move into this area here, and they're gonna begin to um, settle in this corner of the Gulf of Mexico. They're gonna develop, according to what our research shows, three major cities, Tres Zapotes, San Lorenzo, okay, and La Venta. If you go to Mexico, southern Mexico now, especially in the provinces and towns in southwest Mexico, they'll tell you there's two black people there, the ones that came on the ship, meaning those who were enslaved, and the ones who came before the ship, meaning those like the Almecs and others who had been here at a point where no one knew when that genesis was. They just were always here. The Olmec problem was the European scientists, after finding it, it was found by a little farmer who was clearing the, ro the, the, the land uh, for him to grow some maize and grow his corn. And he found what looked like an upside down pot. And when he called the owner of the land over, they found out what it was and he excavated it and they found this gigantic head. Now that was back early in 1837 or 1897 or something around that time. When they found that and they saw this Africoid face, that completely turned everything around because they thought the Mayan civilization was the oldest civilization here. Now, when they found that the Mayan civilization was not the oldest civilization and that Africans all through the histories were supposedly brought here as slaves, they did not want to fess up and change their whole curriculum to state that there was an African civilization in the Americas some 5,000, 10,000 years ago. The other part of it is that during the reconstruction period after the Civil War, the Vatican put out an edict very quietly that all Western books and academia had to first be uh, passed through the Vatican census. So the Vatican said that any evidence of black history here had to be taken off of the history book. This man, Ko, who essentially became the, 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 the top man that you went to see about Mesoamerican civilization, he worked for the CIA. When I was down there, in Mexico, I saw one old Mex statue. It was very interesting to me. It had the face of an African person. And the name of the statue was actually called Monkey Looking in the Sky. And what they would do, they would try to pretend that a lot of these statues were actually animals. Like the Olmec heads, they would try to say that they were jaguars and they were aliens from outer space. The, the European um, archeologists would try to make up anything to say that they were not black. But this one statue called Monkey Looking in the Sky is clearly not a monkey because first of all, monkeys don't have full lips and it looks like a person, it is a person. And this just goes to show the depths that these archeologists will go to, to deny the African history. One of the earliest groups that I can find archeologically would be the Folsom people, F-O-L-S-O-M. That's why you go out, you look at your map, you find great various areas that we call the Folsom areas, Folsom, Arizona, Folsom, Nevada, Folsom, you go out in, 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 in New Mexico, you find Folsom Prison, and you find you find one, and one of the biggest archaeological and oldest digs in America is called the Folsom Archaeological Findings out there, where they found all these African artifacts in the ground. And that was 16,000 years ago. 6,000 years ago, Asians began to migrate across the Burren Straits into the United States, and they came into the United States, across the Burren Straits, into Canada, then down to the northern part of the United States, <clears throat> and down into the southern part, and they interbred and met and interbred with blacks, those Folsom people. And otherwise, that's why American Indians never had slant eyes and were never yellow skinned. They became round eyed and, and brown skinned and red skinned. 
all over the, the, the country of Costa Rica, you have these little African-like statues just all over the place. And when you go to the museums, you see these African artifacts, African-style gold, a lot of monuments and artifacts that resemble mar monuments and artifacts from West Africa. You have one part of the Mississippi River go one way, the other part goes the other way. In the Y of that uh, split, you have a place that Native Americans call Cahokia. Today it's called Collinsville, Illinois. It's near St. Louis. This is where you have the largest pyramid in the Northern Hemisphere. It's called Monk's Mound. If you look at pictures from the 1900s and beyond, most of the Native American people were very dark skinned. Sometimes they were very jet black, but most Native American people before 1900, if you look at photos of them, they're extremely dark skinned people, especially on the West Coast, like in California, the California Indians were very dark skinned. The Indians that were around the Minnesota, Milwaukee area that we know as Milwaukee and Minnesota now, they were very dark skinned people. The Native Americans on the East Coast were very dark skinned people. In the late 1800s, there was something called the Dolls Rolls, which was basically a census that made records of people's ethnic backgrounds in order to determine which Native American tribes would get certain land allotments and other benefits. After slavery, many black people were associated with some of these tribes by bloodline, through marriage, through adoption, and even servitude. And because they were associated with these tribes, many black people were entitled to some of these benefits. The government did not want blacks to get these benefits, so they created a separate freedmen's list specifically for black people. They also started to list any full-blooded Native American who had African features as black because they didn't want them getting those benefits either. At the same time, they allowed white citizens to come in and pay money under the table to be listed as part Native American. Uh, 1890, 1895 and 1896, when a lot of the whites found out the benefits that, that, these, Indians, that these blacks were going to be entitled to, a lot of whites went to the Dawes Commission and said, look, uh, why don't you put my name on there? They said, but you're not an Indian. So that's what they said, well, I'll give you five dollars. So they, they, the rule got around, the policy got around that, that for five dollars, that a white could put his name on the dolls rolls and be called himself an Indian and be entitled to all these benefits and all their children could be entitled to all these benefits forever. And so that's, that became known as what's called a five dollar Indian. And so if you go around now and check most of the Indians, the so-called Indians in America, about 90% of them are not even Indians. Those are just whites now who are passing as Indians and but they're getting all the benefits and they're not paying any taxes getting free college education they put up a little reservation on the land that they don't live on they have another home off uh, and get all kind of benefits iron eyes cody was another famous native american person um, he was in the media for years. Um, in the 1970s, they utilized him for this uh, pollution commercial. He was known as the Crying Indian. So he was a very well-known Native American in um, American culture. But the reality is, Iron Eyes Cody wasn't Native American at all. He was Sicilian. Both of his parents were from Sicily. So he didn't have one drop of Native American blood in him. He was another fake Indian. first authorized paintings from the Americas was of these three African men who were the leaders of a maroon colony down in Central America. And these men, they were, the legend is that they were enslaved Africans who escaped and they were shipwrecked and they formed a maroon colony down in Central America and they became leaders of the Native American tribes down in Central America. And this painting of these three African men, it's at a museum in Madrid, Spain today. Bukman, Haitian Revolution, the original revolutionary, because he was turned in the night of the revolution. That's when Toussaint Louverture took over. The book irritated Genie. We need to read. The name was Bukman. Bukman was called Bukman from Jamaica because he couldn't be handled in Jamaica. He was sold to Haiti. He started a rebellion amongst the African people. 
and they knew him as Bukman because they always read. He was very intelligent. He always taught the people who they were and what they were. The night before the revolution, Bukman looked to his brothers and sisters in the field, and he said, you want to win? Cast aside your white God. Embrace your African spirit. You are free. He didn't say you will be free. He didn't say you can be free. He didn't say you could be free. He said, cast aside your white God. You are free. Had it not been for the Haitian Revolution, America would be 50% of its current size, if not more. The Louisiana Purchase doubled America's size, and it would have never been a Louisiana Purchase if there had never been a Bookman Dada, Jean-Jacques Dessalines, and Toussaint Le Overture, because it was their victory over Napoleon's army that bankrupted the banks of France and forced them to sell its shares of land in America to this country. Toussaint Louverture gave millions of dollars to a man named Stephen Girard. He was a European sea captain. And Toussaint Louverture gave him this money to get arms because they were gonna set up um, a colony in Africa to fight slavery. And when Toussaint Louverture went to prison, Stephen Girard would not return the money to Toussaint Louverture and his descendants and, and his family. So Stephen Girard took the money, the millions of dollars that he got from Toussaint Louverture, came to America, started Girard College, and he really became the first American millionaire. And so a lot of people don't know that Girard College was founded on stolen money from Toussaint Louverture. Down in Peru, they found a mummified body of a Peruvian girl who was sacrificed about 500 years ago. And the Peruvian girl, if you look at her, her body's well-preserved. She has African features, African facial features. She even has African-style braids. And this Peruvian mummified girl is still on display. The HMS Challenger was a ship that went on an expedition in the 1870s. And they went to different places around the world. And one of the places they went to was a place down in South America called Terra de Fuego. It's right on the tip of South America. And they took photographs of some of the Native American people there. And one of the Native Americans down there, one of the Native American pictures they took is a man who looks like a West African man. He's pure Native American, though. And this picture of this Native American man who looks like a West African this photograph is at the London Museum to this day. So this just goes to show many African-looking people were already over here. Remember, when they attacked Africa, they did not attack Africa physically. They did not attack Africa educationally. They attacked Africa spiritually. Jomo Kenyatta said when the European first came to Africa, the Africans had the land and the white man had the Bible. White man told him to close his eyes, get on his knees and pray. Jomo said when the black man opened his eyes, the white man had the land and the black man had the Bible. We have bought into a story that we told them. They have twisted it. They got it twisted. We have now bought that story back. What we call the African and the communities that that person lived in is where the concept of religion comes from. Europe never produced a religion, ever. Asia receives its religion from Africa. All of them. Buddhism, Hinduism, Shinto. As a matter of fact, to be more scholarly, starts with Hinduism. The first Hindu gods to come across were black African. And they came across, they were actually, they were called Sambo, which is now a derogatory term used for blacks, mulattoes, etc. Uh, Sambo. I said Judaism, Christianity, and Islam are merely fragments from the periphery of the African spiritual system that you call Voodoo. People said, you can't even go there with that. I can go there with that, and I can take on any theologian that you got, bring them down, 
and I'll show you. Give me your 12 tribes. Give me your 12 disciples. Give me your 99 pearls of faith of Islam, and I'll show you. Those are nothing but sets of qualities and attributes, and I can juxtapose them in a perpendicular line besides the Orishas of the Yoruba, besides the Loas of the Voodoo, besides the Netas of Egypt, and show you we're talking about the same system. Jesus is a name which did not come into existence in the English form until the 1600s. The letter J was not invented until the 1600s. Let me say this again. Now, the letter J was not invented until the 1600s. So the reality is Jesus is not the name of that person. His name is an, an a, uh, Amharic name, uh, Yeshua. 1482, Leonardo da Vinci was commissioned to paint a painting of Christ and the 12 disciples. This was 1482, 10 years before Columbus set sail because that painting would be the greatest weapon used in colonialism and still is right now because many black people around the world still have that original uh, Last Supper. And so when Leonardo was asked to paint that picture, he got his uncle to actually sit in. And this is an historic record. He got his uncle to sit in and pose as Christ. And he got 12 criminals from a local jail who happened to be available to sit in as the 12 disciples. The only reason you call God by that name is because your former enslaver, your former oppressor taught you that name. He never taught you the real name. He never gave you the keys to the power to free yourself spiritually so that you, you are now spiritually or religiously still a slave. The African population in North America is the third largest black population in the world in any geopolitical state. Why don't we have a single word out of one of our language for God that we use? The Arabs use their word for God. The uh, Jews use their word for God. The Catholics use their word for God. The Japanese use their word for God. The African is the only population that don't have an African word for God. Yet, studies coming out of Geneva over the last 30 years prove that we are the most um, spiritual people in America, in the world, not just America. We worship with a greater propensity than any other people in the world, but we don't have a single word in our language for our divine. The word Christ is a title. It's not a name. Christ means the anointed one. And there were many people before the birth of Jesus who also bore that title, Christ. There were 16 people who were known as Christ. So Jesus was the last of saviors of mankind, saviors of a group of people who were known as Christ. When you talk about the image of Christ, it is important that we no longer uh, ascribe to the European image of Christ. Why? Because the brain is an associating organism. It stores everything as pictures. And because it is associating, if you force feed an African child that Christ is white, because the brain associates, as that child begins to grow, the brain will associate white Christ with white people. And so if white Jesus is God, then white people must also be the gods of humanity. And so guess what? The power in the painting is transferred to the people who resemble that painting. And so it is difficult to pray to a white Jesus and not in some way feel inferior to white people. And that's why when I talk to Christian ministers, I often tell them, you have to change these pictures. They say it don't matter. Of course it matters. Why do you think the European went around the world and systematically altered the image of Christ in every major cathedral, every major church? every corner of the globe because it is difficult to oppress a people whose image of the God doesn't look like the oppressor. But when God and the oppressor look one in the same, then the people will come to believe that the oppression was ordained by God. What we find is that in this story that came out of Kemet, after uh, Aset reconstituted the body of, of, of her husband Asar, the spirit of Asar came and impregnated his virgin wife, Aset. And then nine months later, the virgin Aset gave birth to her son, Heru. And Heru was born 4,000 years ago on December the 25th.
So in 325, it was decided that Jesus Christ would be a son of God. In 325, it was decided that Jesus Christ would be born in the manger in Bethlehem. Up until the Nicene Council, most people believe that Jesus Christ was born in a cave in Ethiopia, even in Ethiopia till today. Christmas was not celebrated in December 25th um, for hundreds of years. It was celebrated in August. They move it to December 25th because that's the Egyptian uh, celebration of the birth of the son of the sun. Talking about Heru and Asaf. The image that we have of Santa Claus is the rosy cheek European jolly guy, and that image was created sometime in the um, early 1800s. But the real Santa Claus was a man by the name of St. Nicholas. And when I do research about St. Nicholas, the real St. Nicholas, the further back I go, the blacker St. Nicholas gets. And when you look at pictures and portraits of St. Nicholas in museums in Europe, St. Nicholas is totally black. And there's a museum in Italy that has an old painting of St. Nicholas, and he has like dark skin, woolly hair. So people have to realize that the Santa Claus that we know and love today is based on a black saint from Europe. The Council of Nicaea uh, was an effort by, by Constantine to control the people through military and through religion. Whoever can control your concept of God has a weapon more powerful than, than, than any physical weapon, than any sword, any, any gun, any atomic weapon. Whoever controls how you relate to the unseen presence of God will not only control you, but can control your children and your children's children. So it was at the Council of Nicaea that the Constantine, this emperor, needed to find a way to consolidate his power because the people that he conquered in various parts of the world had different religions, different, different ideologies. And it was at <clears throat> Nicaea where he brought together these theologians, these, these scholars, if you will, to hammer out one uniform theology that everyone would follow. And if Constantine could convince people to take Jesus as God on earth and change that he was a human being, then they could take over the control of the Catholic Church and make one. So they invited. And one of the priests was an African known as Arius, Bishop Arius. There's a book called Blacks Who Died for Jesus by Mark Hyman. It gives the story of Arius. Arius now gets word that Constantine knows Arius is coming to, to dispute this. Because he's saying, how are you going to tell people this? That, nobody's going to believe that story. That, that Immaculate Conception? Come on, you know, that's written on the walls of Egypt. That's a mythology. That's an analogy. You're not supposed to believe that story. That's a nice story to live by, that each and every one of us has Jesus within us, and every birth is an Immaculate Conception. But there was no one boy born as the son of God to free. Come on, you, 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 you can't. Constantine said, look, come on over here. Nice here, I'm going to talk to you. He found out that he was going to be assassinated. So he fled into Europe with his followers. Arius and his followers became known as the Arians. Wouldn't Hitler have a heart attack if he knew who the real Arians were? They were a bunch of black folk. Everybody who was worshiping Isis and dealing with mostly a comedic religious philosophy they said, we can't do this. This is ridiculous. This reminds me, there's no man called Jesus Christ. We ain't never heard of him. Well, Jesus Christ will take Hesus, which was the, the sun god in the West, and will take Christos, which was the sun god in the East, and we'll put them together. We'll have a, a name. And so what did he do? A man named Apollonius of Tyana, at that time, who had studied philosophy in Kemet, was teaching. He was a healer, working miracles. He was a hero at that time, so he became the template for Jesus Christ. The first slave ship, the first ship that was used to bring Africans from the continent and transport them across the Americas was known as the good ship Jesus. And as Alex Haley said when he did his research for Roots, he said that traditionally when Africans were loaded on the slave ships, the captain in his log 
would see to it that the first two people loaded aboard those slave ships were a man and a woman, and they were recorded in the ship's log as Adam and Eve. The African priests were always smarter than the European thief. Always remember that. The thief is never smarter than the one he or she is taking from. The one he or she is taking from is a superior being. That's why you're stealing. This is the whole point to why you're taking. Because what we got, you ain't got. And in the, in the case of King James, I believe it was 1604 when he initiated, 1604, 1609, when he commissioned a group of 50 men to pull together all of the references all of the biblical references in existence. And one of the men who, it is said, participated in this project was the most prolific writer of the English language at that time, a young poet by the name of William Shakespeare. William Shakespeare did work on that project, but as with many religious works that were commissioned during that era, none of the authors were allowed to put their signatures on their works. So artists being the creative people that they are, found creative ways of putting their signatures. In Psalms 46, uh, verse three, and Psalms 46, verse nine. 46 words from the beginning of Psalms 46 is the word shake. The 46 word from the end of Psalms uh, 46, uh, 9 is the word spear, Shakespeare's name. Now, if you look at other versions of the Bible, not the King James Version, but other versions of the Bible, you won't find that same correlation, only in the King James Version. We are so far removed from the reality of our African spirituality. And until we cast aside that white God, we can't be free. There's a war of genocide that the ignorance of Europe and Asia is allowing them for the sake of trying not to be faced with genetic annihilation has allowed them to concoct ways of murdering us. I mean, we can go to the syphilis experiments at Tuskegee, or we can go to the AIDS in Africa. I mean, look at this thing in Africa, but there's no, we got AIDS, and so everybody in Africa, all of a sudden, some of the first, we saw popped up in New York City in the homosexual community, now pops up in Africa, and tens of millions of people have got it, and the pharmaceutical company is going crazy selling them drugs that they have to stay on for perpetuity. Billions and billions, if not trillions of dollars, you are guaranteed because all these Africans have to take this medicine for the rest of their life. Give me a break. You tell me the guy who enslaved me, the guy who practiced colonialism against me, the guy who raped my mama, my sister, cut the testicles off my father, ripped me apart with horses, all of a sudden is gonna come to my well-being and make me a medicine that's good for me, when his whole history is about profit and genocide at any cost, even if it meant killing his mother. And I'm not just talking about our European brothers and sisters as regards dealing with the black brothers and sisters. If you just read uh, books on the Inquisition and the horror and the genocide waged against European working people, and the women of Europe is so horrific, it makes even the transatlantic slave trade looks pale sometimes. The whole AIDS hoax has been about us getting to take the medication. There's no HIV that creates AIDS. They found that the HIV is a very innocuous, very benign uh, so-called virus and doesn't cause anything. What does cause AIDS is drugs, the taking of medications. And what created the AIDS condition in the homosexual community that came what is known as GRID, 
gay-related immunodeficiency were these poppers, amyl nitrate and butyl nitrate. These, these things that we use for the heart to dilate the muscles, well, the homosexual community, the one who created it into these little popping things, it, it, when you broke the seal, it made a pop, so they call them poppers. It was the inhalation of these things that began to bring down the so-called immune system of the homosexuals, and they began to have this immunodeficiency based upon overuse of this. Why did they use these poppers? Because when they used these poppers and they inhaled it, not only did they get the rush, but the anus began to dilate and relax. So the homosexuals were using this left and right. Thousands were being sold here in New York. And when they found that, and they did not put in that poppers were the ones and that drugs and these poisonous medications were creating the conditions called AIDS. They took the opportunity to ride the HIV AIDS connection because they knew the money that would be made and that they could recruit people into believing that a heinous a disease had attacked everybody. And where did it come from? Africa. It's, it's always wise to study your enemy. If you're going to defeat someone, uh, you must know their strengths and their weaknesses. People have been utilizing Africans to heal themselves for centuries and people have been going to African shamans, African witch doctors to find cures for themselves, that Eastern medicine. So people have been going to African people to cure themselves for years. The doctor that's given credit for a lot of the internal examinations that women go through, those instruments were first tested on women who were enslaved. And I can only imagine, well, I can't even imagine, a woman could imagine, but the kind of pain that that woman was put through to test those particular iron steel objects that would go up through their bodies. In the United States, what they would do with slave children, and this has been well documented, um, to cure rheumatism and to cure gout and to cure arthritis, they would place their feet on top of a slave child and just keep their feet there for hours, thinking that the, the child, the melanin, would draw out whatever sickness the slave masters would have. Well, we know that a lot of things have happened in our hospitals. We, we know that experiments was used on our people in almost every city, city hospital in America. Henrietta Lacks was uh, a sister who lived in Baltimore and who had cervical cancer and uh, ultimately died of cervical cancer. And uh, the doctors harvested some of her cells. And what they discovered in performing tests on her cells were that her cells were immune to specific diseases, specific cancers. So there was a quality in her cells that was resistant to disease. And they began to develop a host of uh, vaccines and treatment modalities using the cells of this black woman. And they never told her family that they had harvested her cells, that they had made millions of dollars, tens of millions of dollars. Henrietta Lacks' own DNA and her cells are all over the world right now because they were so prolific they just kept on multiplying. That was an indication of the fact that as African peoples, we hold the genetics for eternal youth. There's a book called Acres of Skin that talks about the experiments that was done on black men in Philadelphia prisons from the 1950s to the 1970s. In addition to the many medical experiments that are done on blacks in hospitals and prisons around the country, many people believe that chemtrails that are often seen over black communities purposely contain chemicals that create adverse reactions within the black community. The chemtrails are dangerous because of what they contain, barium, strontium, and genetically altered red blood cells. What are genetically altered red blood cells doing in an aerosol? If you go to Harvard, they have a place on the campus, one of the tallest buildings on Harvard University is called the Herbarium, the Herbarium. In there, every floor is dedicated to some parts of Africa and Asia, and mostly Africa, where the young scholars who are working on their PhD is sent to study the, the fauna 
and the herbs and the plants of these places and to interview the so-called healers and witch doctors and come back to Harvard and tell what medicine, what medicinal purposes these herbs, fauna, and plants are used for. And then they create synthetic versions of it and sell that formula to the pharmaceutical companies. There's a drug epidemic in a neighborhood and the hospital is quiet. Forget law enforcement for a minute. The hospital, th this is the center of the community's health, and the hospital is quiet. So we're in a situation where the institutions by which we live are conspiring against us. There's no such thing as an institution that is standing with its lights on and people going in and out of the institution, and you're still not receiving the service of the institution. How, how, can it, that's, how is that possible that there is a standing hospital in most neighborhoods and everyone's sick? How is it possible that there is a police department in every neighborhood, several, and crime is still what it is? How is it possible that there is a, 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 a public school and people are dumber? I argue conspiracy. The black community is really the only community that's really afraid of hospitals. If you go around the country and talk to different um, African-American people, they have horror stories about certain hospitals within the neighborhoods. Out here in Los Angeles, you have a hospital called King Drew Medical Center. Well, it, it, it was closed down, but they had a hospital called the King Drew Medical Center. And if you ask any black person in Los Angeles, they say, well, that's Killer King Hospital. It was known for people going in there for minor ailments and not coming out. And there were all types of rumors about King Drew Medical Center. Some people said they, they were selling organs, they were killing black people, selling off their body parts. There was a story in the LA Times um, talking about how people were so afraid to go to the King Drew Medical Center that if they got injured, they would run from the ambulance if they knew the ambulance was gonna take them to the King Drew Medical Center. So that type of reputation has been um, going on in the black community for years about certain hospitals in the area. It is very difficult to use black people to experiment and find out cures because of melanin. That's why experimentally, doctors and Europeans use white mice. They use albinoid mice because the outcome after you go into a white mouse is what's going to happen to a white person. If you use brown and black mice, the outcome is not going to be for white people because a, a black and brown mice is a melanated mouse. A white mouse is an albinoid. That's why they got pink eyes. Uh, melanin is an, is an alkaloid. The chemical structure of melanin is an alkaloid, and it is similar to the chemical structure of other alkaloids, which are... Uh, heroin, cocaine, and marijuana. And the other important aspect of this is because of the fact that melanin is an alkaloid, it binds to other alkaloids. So black folk who uh, smoke crack or do cocaine, heroin, or marijuana are inclined to get higher faster and have a more intense high because of the alkaloid in, in, the, in the melanin binds to the alkaloid in that drug, which consequently means that people of African ancestry are going to become addicted faster and have a more difficult time trying to kick those drugs. It wasn't just crack cocaine that came into the black and Latino areas. It was a way of life that came into the, to, to, to the areas that replaced another way of life. Let me go back a little bit. Just before the crack cocaine way of life, you had the cocaine way of life. You know, not to call any names, but the, the pinnacle is Studio 54, uh, where, you, you know, this 70s New York City nightlife, where cocaine is everywhere and, and flagrant. In rap music, uh, in early MC and DJ, and you get MCs on the mic saying, cocaine, cocaine, somebody say blow, blow, that, all of that kind of stuff, early uh, uh, parties. Before that, this is, I'm talking just now 77, 76, before that, go back 75, 74, 73. Heroin was the lifestyle 
that was pushed onto the black and Latino community. Each one of these destructive lifestyles were introduced into the community. The youth in the country in the 60s almost brought us to the democracy we say we are. And the, 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 the tyranny that rules our country by controlling the economy of this country decide to bring drugs and then use the war on drugs to create laws like the three strikes and you out and the Rockefeller laws that are as worse as any we saw in the Soviet Union during the Stalinist period to put the young people in prison, many of them for the rest of their lives for crimes that normally you would have walked after a year or two. The 13th Amendment reads, slavery is abolished except when you are found guilty of a crime and go to jail. So prison is the slave plantation. And look at all the things that are denied you in jail is the same thing that were denied Africans on the plantation. Slavery still is very much alive. Today, uh, there are more African-American adults under correctional control in prison or jail on probation or parole than were enslaved in 1850, a decade before the Civil War began. Crime and crime rates did not drive mass incarceration to begin with. Um, you know, incarceration rates have fluctuated over the years, gone up, gone down today, you know, are actually at historical lows. But incarceration rates, especially black incarceration rates, have consistently soared regardless of whether crime was going up or going down in any given community or the nation as a whole. War on drugs, which has been a major engine of mass incarceration, has targeted poor communities of color, especially black and brown men, even though studies have consistently shown now for decades that people of color are no more likely to use or sell illegal drugs than white. Before 1964, the prison rate in America, the majority of people in prison were white people, were white guys. But the thing is, there was no need to have a strong police presence in the black community because black people were already controlled by the basic laws of the, of the land. Black people were already controlled by Jim Crow laws, signs saying black people drink from this water fountain, black people couldn't live in this neighborhood. So black people were just controlled, period, at that time. Now, after the Civil Rights Bill passed in 1964, this is when the police presence became very strong in the black community because the average citizen couldn't control black people like they could before then. So they came up with another strategy and had law enforcement do it. So around 1964, 65, black communities were flooded with law enforcement. And this is why the Black Panthers were started because of the police brutality that had started in the black community. Prisoners themselves represent a small percentage of the population under correctional control. Like today, there's about 7.6 million people under correctional control, but only about 1.3 million are in prison of that. The rest are on probation, parole, in jail overwhelmingly for you know, minor nonviolent offenses and drug offenses. The problem is, is that even if you don't get prison time, even if you're lucky enough to get just felony probation, you're saddled for the rest of your life with a felony record. And so the question is, in, in my view, just who's in prison? The question is, who is branded a criminal or felon and must live with that label for the rest of their lives? The people said, well, if we don't need black labor anymore, what do we do with it? Well, we have to set up a system in the commercial, in the commercial system, or at least incorporate black people into the commercial system so that they make us money without having to do the labor of you know, kicking cotton or picking sugar cane or whatever. We already passed that. So how do we make a more sophisticated plantation where we can keep slaves? Well, let's criminalize pretty much every damn thing that we do. There are over a million 
laws on the books now. Who needs a million laws unless you want to control people's behavior? The police presence has always been in the black community because we are prisoners of war. That's number one. The original police were created to catch slaves. They were slave catchers. There was no need to police a white society. There was no need for that in early America. There was no need for that. Police even became wild when uh, it, police were always about guarding property. That's what the police are about, guarding property. That's it. Their job gets stretched out to a moral responsibility and public safety uh, and that kind of thing later on in their development. But the original concept of a police officer is to make sure your property stays with you. They are hired by the rich, first of all to protect the richest property. People of all races who are jobless, especially chronically jobless, are more likely to be violent than those who are not. And ghettoized communities are areas of concentrated poverty and joblessness. So it's not a surprise that there are higher rates of violent crime and this idea that there's something especially wrong with black men that makes them more likely to be violent or especially wrong with black culture um, that leads to high rates of violence is just disproved by all of the available evidence. If we were to invest in education and job creation in the communities that need it most and eradicate these high levels of joblessness, we would also see the racial disparity and violent crime disappear. A lot of people don't know the original street gangs in America were European immigrants, and the movie Gangs of New York goes into that, how these Europeans came over and they formed the first street gangs in America. And the thing is, they weren't demonized. There was a wave of white crime, um, you know, where white immigrants coming to the United States who were jobless and poor were engaging in high rates of crime. Um, but the response wasn't, let's lock them all up and throw away the key. The response was, what can we do to save our young men? And they went in and invested in education and job creation and providing social services and a safety net to ensure that these young men did not slip through the cracks. and. Uh, viewed them as one of us who need uh, to be protected and, and saved, whereas young black men in ghettoized communities are viewed today as largely disposable. 80% of prisons are found in Republican districts because you may have a town of, let's say, 20,000 people. Let's say you have 20,000 prisoners in the prison in your community. When it's time to be taxed, when it's time to get money from the government, you have 40,000 people. And even though those other 20,000 never get money that are in prison, they're accounted for in your population. There's an extraordinary amount of money being made off of mass incarceration today. I mean, part of it is private prisons, um, which are making their money, you know, from caging human beings quite directly. But there's also a range of other private corporate interests that are profiting um, from the prison industry today. Private pr um, phone companies <laughs> that charge prisoners and their families exorbitant rates just to place phone calls um, and remain in touch with loved ones. Um, laser gun manufacturers, private health care providers that provide typically abysmal health care to people behind bars, um, you know, have secured very lucrative contracts, um, you know, and then, you know, there's private corporations that are now using prison labor, you know, rather than shipping jobs overseas, are actually using prison labor, paying them far less than minimum wage. Many of these furnitures we see in all the state offices and stuff, they're made by brothers and sisters in prison. They try to make it seem like it's just license plate. It's a lot more than that. Then all, the, all of them are located in areas where they're farms, and almost all of them are loaned out to work these farms, where they're getting only pennies a day slavery.
Many of these agencies get rewarded in cash by the millions for the sheer numbers of people swept in um, for drug offenses, which helps to explain why so many law enforcement agencies go out looking for the so-called low-hanging fruit, stopping, frisking, searching as many people as possible in the hopes of boosting their numbers up and continuing to qualify um, for funding. Anytime you can put your prison on the stock market, it means you have already have a methodology to guarantee the commodity, and the commodity is the imprisoned young black man and woman. You're given a number, and you're warehoused in this cell, and you become a warehouse receipt. So more jails are kept up because the warehouse receipts, and if you don't have anybody in jail, you're not making any money. So you need to keep the jails filled in order for those warehouse receipts to be traded on Wall Street and the insurance companies to be making money each time. Drug markets, much like American society generally, are fairly segregated by race. Black folks typically sell to black folks, Latinos to each other. Drug markets are even segregated by class. You know, university students sell to each other. Um, you know, drug dealing happens in every community of all colors, but those who do time for drug crime are overwhelmingly black and brown. President Richard Nixon was the first to coin the term a war on drugs, but it was President Ronald Reagan, really, who turned that rhetorical war into a literal one. And he declared his drug war in 1982, um, actually a couple of years before crack first began to ravage inner city communities and become a media sensation. The media frenzy around crack cocaine didn't just happen, it was actually part of, you know, uh, a political campaign conducted by the Reagan administration to sensationalize crack use in inner city communities to boost public support for a drug war they had already declared and persuade Congress to devote millions more dollars to waging it. After crack became a media sensation, um, harsh mandatory minimum sentences started sailing through Congress, you know, harsh mandatory minimum sentences for minor drug offenses, sentences larger than murderers receive in many other Western democracies. And soon, Democrats began competing with Republicans to prove they could be even tougher on them, those people, than their Republican counterparts. And so it was President Bill Clinton who actually escalated the drug war far beyond what Reagan and his Republican predecessors even dreamed possible. There was a representative in Missouri named Chuck Graham, and he had a proposal. He had something called the Life for Life program. And with this program, they wanted to offer prisoners on death row lighter sentences if they were to donate one of their organs or body parts. Well, the war on drugs was part of a grand Republican Party strategy known as the Southern Strategy of using racially coded, get tough appeals on issues of crime and welfare to appeal to poor and working class whites, particularly in the South, who are anxious about or resentful of many of the gains of African Americans in the civil rights movement. And um, President Richard Nixon's um, former chief of staff, um, Haldeman, um, described the strategy this way, and I believe I'm recalling the quote correctly. He said, quote, the whole problem is really the blacks. The key is to devise a system that recognizes this while not appearing to, end quote. The meth ep epidemic has been severe, and you know some have argued that the meth epidemic is actually far worse than what the crack epidemic um, was in terms of the harm um, that it caused. But you know there hasn't been any media frenzy associated with the meth epidemic. There has been an increase in the number of whites going to prison for drug offenses since the meth epidemic, but there hasn't been an all-out war waged um, against against, um, you know, people who, who are predominantly white, who use and sell meth. It doesn't matter how severe the racial disparities are, unless you have, can offer proof of conscious intentional bias tantamount to an admission of racial bias by a law enforcement official. You can't even state a claim for racial bias in the criminal justice system today, which presents a bit of a challenge since most law enforcement officials, like the rest of us, know better than to state our racial biases out loud. A police officer isn't gonna say, yes, your honor, the reason I stopped him was, well, because he was black.
people look at it as a civil rights violation, but it's really a human rights violation because it's criminal what they're doing to black people on a mass scale, criminalizing the image of black people and railroading them into a jail system really for profit. That's slavery and that's a human rights issue and black people need to start treating that as a human rights issue. So we shouldn't go to the courts here because the courts here are in cahoots with the private organizations that's railroading all of these black men into the prison system. So if black people are gonna do anything, they need to take this fight to the world court, to the world stage. Well, I do think uh, mass incarceration is a human rights issue, a human rights crisis. Um, and there have been efforts to bring these issues to the United Nations and to international um, courts. And um, I think we should continue to do so. I do think we should avail ourselves of those tribunals and make more of an effort to educate people in other countries about the realities of what is going on in the United States. So many people around the world today think that the U.S. is the land of great racial equality, especially with the election of Barack Obama, and it's important for the other story to be told. At the time, you know, we had just come back from um, Vietnam, and there was a threat King David and King Alfred Pram because of the blacks. And remember, most, it was mostly blacks that were fighting in the end in Vietnam. And they feared, at least this is my conjecture, they feared that these soldiers were coming back home with the knowledge of warfare and all the tactics that they learned about the Europeans and warfare were to be used on them. The King Alfred plan was to make sure that they would round up people into concentration camps the way they did with the Japanese, the internment camps, as well as to shut down areas, grids of electricity in the areas where blacks were consolidated. Also to place um, bombs, most people don't know, to place uh, in impediments or areas or to set up roadblocks or to quadrant off whole communities. Freeway systems in black areas are designed to really regulate the community. For example, out here in Los Angeles, South Central LA is really surrounded by four freeways. It's surrounded by the 10 freeway, the 110, the 405 freeway, and the 105 freeway. During the LA riots in 1992, um, a lot of people don't know that they actually shut the freeways down and they were gonna start bringing in the National Guard, where they actually did bring in the National Guard. So the black community, they always have freeway systems there because they never know when they need to implement that King Alfred plan, when they need to go in there with military tanks, if there's some racial insurrection and really suppress the black community. So that's one of the reasons for the freeway systems being directly on top of the black communities around the country. And every black community in America got expressways that went right through them, destroyed them. If you want to find out where the old black community used to be, go find, go in that city and find the expressways. There's a direct relationship between having the businesses and being in prison. Go find an, see how many Asians you can find in American prisons. You ain't going to be in there. But 51% of your prison will be black because you don't, blacks don't have any businesses and industries. There's a direct link. Blacks won't practice group economics. Blacks won't practice group politics. If you don't practice, you're setting yourself up. I told that five-story building, you set yourself to get wiped out. Understand the nature of race, which is economics. If you, if you build the first floor, it's economic. Build your businesses and your industries. Control buildings and industry, and put that pools in your money, and hold that money, and, as a, and practice group economics <clears throat> with it. Arab and Asian money bounces eight, 12 to 13 times what it leaves. Jewish money bounces 18 times. Black folk gotta learn how to practice group economics. Black Americans spend every penny they get outside their own community. Then you take the money and the wealth that you get from that first floor and go to the second floor. The second floor is politics. You then take that money on the first floor and you control your politics. Black folk must quit allowing people to tell them to go out and vote. Vote for what? Nobody's gonna do anything for black folk in politics. Politics is controlled by money. Major corporations who got the money. That's what controls politics. If you have no money, you have no say-so, you have no benefits coming. So you take your money and you control and you take your money from the first floor, you buy every politician on the second floor. And any politician you can't buy, you rent or lease them to get what you need. 
Then once you get the second floor under control with your politician, with your money, then you go to the third floor. The third floor then is the police department and the court system. You take your money from the first floor and your politics on the second floor and you control the court system and the police departments. Then the fourth floor, you t- is, the fourth floor then is media. You then take the money that you generate off the first floor from business and industries <clears throat> and you go after radio stations, TV stations, newspapers, and cable systems so that you can now inform and communicate with your own people. Right now, <clears throat> black folk own and control less than 35 thousandths of 1% of the media in the United States. Out of 12,000 radio stations, black folk own about something like about 75, 80. That's all. You own no cable systems. You don't have a daily newspaper. You have nothing of importance. You don't, you got about one black TV station. And you, so you can't communicate with your people. You can't inform your people. You can't do anything. You can have Rush Limbaugh and all the rest of the guys talking about racism all day long and bad mouthing you. And old Riley's, they can talk, call black folk all kind of names all day long. What are you going to do? You can't respond. You can't even communicate with your own people because you don't have a, you don't have an economic base. 51 percent of all the prisoners in the United States are black people. You know, you know, you only make up 12 percent of the population. That's no accident. It's because you don't control the economics and the politics. And they're going to go after the weakest people they can get their hands on to incarcerate them. That's the black folk. And what are you going to do in response to them when they, when they, when they over incarcerate you? You're going to go out and have a march, a demonstration. We're going to march. March for what? Who cares? March they never changed anything. The prison industrial complex is not going to work because you cannot put people in prison that way naturally. It'll last a while. They have your fun. But within 100 years, that's not going to exist. I believe white supremacy was born to die, and everything it does in its ignorant arrogance kills itself. It's meant to die. And what they're doing is they're setting up their own suicide by doing that to other human beings. Some of the most gifted human beings I've met were in prison. Some of the most gifted human beings I've ever met have been in special education. And to think that those young people, male and female, could be educated to cure cancer, to to go into outer space, to build things that our community needs, but you'd rather put them in prison because of the color of their skin, what goes around comes around. You shall reap what you sow. The best way to control melanated people is keeping them poor and disenfranchised, and this is what has happened to black people in America. There's a reason why black people have been economically undermined, because it's very easy to control poor people. When people are poor, you can do whatever you want to to them, and they won't have the economic power to fight back. They won't have the economic power to put a politician into power to help them out. They won't have the economic base to really take care of their basic needs, so then you can control them any way you want to. See, white folk lend us money. They don't pay us, because they know that they're going to get it right back. 1866, and, uh, and up to about 19, into the 19, 1920s, black folk had the greatest economic achievement they've ever had in this country. Even though even under, if it didn't occur under integration, it occurred under segregation. Those black folk had, had managed to acquire over 20 million acres of land. In, according to the United States Census in 1920. 20 million acres of land. But between 1920s and 1950s, they lost almost all of it. Back in the 1920s and up to the 1940s, we had black broom factories, we had black mattress factories. Almost every black major city had at least two cab companies. We had, uh, we had black bus companies, we had black shipyard up here in Baltimore. And when I say black bus lines, I'm not talking about just having three or four buses. We had over 500 buses. And, I, and this is in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. And our bus, our bus company didn't just service just the black neighborhoods, it serviced the blacks and the white neighborhoods. We had two black cab companies. We had the Harris Cab Companies and the Campbell City Cab Companies. But they used to have their own restaurants, they had the best nightclubs in the country. The black blacks had two baseball leagues. Each baseball league had eight teams. We had over 500 of the best baseball players in the world. But what did they do? They wanted to integrate. So as soon as they put Jackie Robinson, with the, with the, with the, uh, on, the, on the Brooklyn Dodgers. Black folks said, we'll give up all of our black baseball leagues, black teams, and all our black players, and we can just get one black boy to play on a white team. 
Uh, black Americans were, were gung-ho about integration because we thought that would be our passport to freedom. We equated integration with freedom. That scared whites to death. And see, at that time, you had whites, a lot of these white separate communities. You had, a Polish, you had white Polish communities, you had white Jewish communities, you had white Italian communities, you had white Irish communities. And white folks said, well, if, oh, we're not going to let, if these blacks want to integrate, we're going to come together and organize as a unit. And so white folks then dropped all of their, all, all their little communities and said, no, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna organize as a one white block. We're not going to talk about I'm being Polish and you're Irish and German anymore. We ain't going to do that anymore. We're going to stick together as a group. We're not going to let all these blacks come and penetrate us. Because we were doing things and becoming self-sufficient, that became a threat. So instead of them just coming out and attacking, because they couldn't just come out with an all-out attack, we were a little bit too strong for that, and we would have fought back, and there would have been a civil unrest that would have definitely undermined the security of the country. Instead, they said, well, let's invite them into a place that they've always coveted, and that is into the white estuaries of power, into the white citadels of power. Let us make sure we bring them in and incorporate them to us. And therefore, being that they're going to have to buy their, their facilities and all their materials from us, they're going to have to interface with us anyway. They're going to dress like us, act like us, and we will take the best of what they have and capitalize eventually and, and, and take it over. We will have quelled or stopped any threat or competition to our business. And that's exactly what they did. The black folks stripped themselves of all their resources. They stripped themselves of their unity. They stripped themselves of the role models when all blacks used to live together. Then they had their own role models. All the doctors and lawyers and teachers with the black lived all together. You had a sense of community. You knew each other, you trusted each other, you worked with each other, you participated with each other. You learned how to buy from each other, to sell each other, to support each other, to care about each other, to love each other. When black folk up into civil, up, up in integration, blacks never locked, locked their homes. We practiced a very profound humanity. If an Asian opened a store in our community, we do not boycott and discriminate against them. If an Arab opened a store in our community, we do not boycott and discriminate against them. If a Jewish person opened a store in our community, we do not boycott and discriminate against them. We shop with all peoples. We treat all peoples equally. The problem is they're not treating us equally. See, we caught in our own humanity. And, and until we began to address that, and demand that others practice towards us the same human concern and love that we practice towards them, we will stay in this situation. Durham, North Carolina was the, was the most progressive and best black Wall Street we had in America. That's why you had all the black major insurance companies, mortgage companies, and banks and all was in, in Durham, North Carolina. Durham, North Carolina was the black Wall Street. Tulsa race riot, and it, it wasn't really a race riot because the people who rioted were the whites, not the Africans. The Africans defended their territory. They defended their stores and their businesses and their families, but they were destroyed by the whites who were envious of the economic power base that they had developed. And so you'll find that um, the disturbance ended when the sheriff of Tulsa commandeered a plane and had the pilot fly over the black community and drop sticks of dynamite. So Tulsa became the first city in the world that was bombed from the air. It was also a way to destroy the ability for a black competition because essentially the world knew what was happening in the United States to black people, and they were gonna give deference to black businesses, in Europe even, because France was ready to do business with Tulsa, Oklahoma. England was ready to do business with Tulsa, Oklahoma, except there are certain parts in parliament that did not want that. Canada was ready to do business. South America was ready to do business with South. 
all of Africa, we were ready to essentially undermine what those cotton plantations had built up in the form of commerce for the United States. And they had to make sure that that was destroyed. There was a group from Tulsa, an RB group from Tulsa, the Gap Band, had a song called You Drop the Bomb on Me, Baby. It's about the Tulsa riot. Gap Band, GAP. GAP are the initials for the streets Greenwood, Archer, and Pine, which was the hub of Black Tulsa Business District. They have this whole thing that black people get handouts, that black people are dependent on the government. Black people, if we're gonna be very honest, black people have never got anything specifically from our government at the exclusion of another group, never. Black people have never got any kind of welfare benefits at the exclusion of another group. Black people have never gotten affirmative action at the exclusion of another group. Affirmative action benefits white women more than anybody. As slavery was affirmative action. Slavery, slavery was affirmative action. Jim Crow segregation was affirmative action. It was rewarding those people who had certain kind of skin complexion. That's what it was for. Affirmative action was written to be corrective action. C-O-R-R-E-C-T-I-V-E, -E, corrective. Corrective action for what? For something that the government has consistently done to impede, to exploit, to degrade, and to degenerate a specific group of people. That's what it was written for. It had nothing to do with, with gender, handicap, senior citizens, gays, midgets, humpbacks, just black people. That's the only people the government had systematically at all levels from the state, county, and federal level had gone out of their way to pass laws, slave codes, and see blacks couldn't get out of slave because of the federal government. The average black business can't even get the capital to present itself to the black population that the other people can get the capital to do. Now, one would ask the question, how can all these poor immigrants come to this country and have all this capital? If they had that capital, why did they leave home? And if they didn't have the capital when they left home, how are they getting this capital here when they have no credit records and they have no paper trail? And they have not, so who's capitalizing them? And I think if we begin to look at that question, we begin to get the, to the bottom of what's going on in the black community. See, and you cannot, you cannot, it's impossible in theory and practice to acquire wealth and power or to be economically competitive without a community. And right now in America, black folk do not have not one single solitary community in America. You cannot prosper, you cannot compete. It's gonna be very difficult for black folk even to survive under the present circumstances because they don't have communities. All black folk got are neighborhoods. A neighborhood is like a bucket with a hole in it. A neighborhood is where you eat and sleep. A community is where you store your values, your history, your wealth, your power, your resources, your jobs, your tax base. And most of these neighborhoods have gotten so bad, so crime-ridden and run down and so dysfunctional that the neighbor has moved and all you got left is a hood. There's nothing left in them. We, we have a ranking order of acceptability in our society based on skin color going white, yellow, brown, black. It's in a descending color order, going from the whitest to the darkest. And the wealth is also distributed along the same lines. The whitest at the top got the wealth, power, and resources going down. It trickles down, all the way down. The power and resources, go, as they go up and down, the further you go away from the white, the, the thinner it becomes, the weaker it becomes. And black folk are not that silly. <clears throat> they can say, consequently, if I want something, I'm gonna try to identify with anything as close to white as possible. And that's why you come up with this saying all the time about white ice is colder than black ice. They wanna identify with it. But they never have to understand that rather than identifying with it, why don't you go acquire your own? Then you can have, then you can have, then your, your, your black ice will be just as cold as white ice. Black folk on an aggregated national disposable basis of, of, of collected income, they might, be the, they might be the ninth richest nation on earth. Right now, if I take all the black folks' money annually and aggregate it, they might be rich, they're richer than maybe Sweden, uh, Canada, India, Pakistan, a uh, whole bunch of countries, Thailand, folks most all put together. But the difference is, what, what, what I keep trying to tell blacks, it doesn't make any difference because it's, it's not aggregated. You aggregate something, you make, you strengthen exponentially the power of it by multiplying, the multiplying fact, factor, by putting them together and then piling it up, making it stronger. And, uh, and but unfortunately, we, we are the only people that see, that don't want that to occur. Because, you know why? Because traditionally, 
whites saw black folk aggregated as being a negative. And so, and we see everything through the eyes of whites. Typically, any time anything that exceeds more than 6% of something that's black, the whites are in charge of it, and you get more than 6%, that sets off alarm in the white society. If right now, if I move into a neighborhood, and, I get, and, I, and, I, and I'm the only black, whites will accept the one, one black, or the two blacks. But the minute you start getting up further than that, they go on alert. So by the time you hit six, you know what happened there? They started putting their houses up for sale. If I go, if I, if, if I have, if I go in an organization, I got one black in that organization, and it's all white organization, they'll accept the one black or two blacks. But the more blacks you come in, trying to integrate, that becomes a threat to the dominant society. And they would, they would either, they'll either move out of that organization, move out of that neighborhood, or even go to their school and take their kids out of the school. And, and where are they gonna move? They're not gonna move to a more integrated society. They're gonna move back with their own people. When a white person takes his kid out of, out of a school, out of an integrated school, he's not going to go and go and try to find another integrated school. He's going to take his, he take his kid to a segregated academy, a charter school, or an all-white suburb. If you went back to, you know, the 1500s, slavery's in full effect, okay? And you go to a slave or an African, and you say right there, while he's picking the cotton, right there, Yo, man, what you think about this whole situation you in right now? You're going to get two types of people. You, no, you're going to get three. You're going to get one type of person say, what situation? I'm just picking cotton. Then you're going to get another person that says, well, you know, it's kind of, you know, Charlie, Master Charlie kind of hard on me, but he all right. Then you get this other person that's like, yo, what's your name? You got something called a MAP? <laughs> I'm trying to get out of here. These are the three people you're going to meet on the plantation. In the 15, in the 15, these are the three people you're going to meet. I don't know what I'm doing here. I don't care that I'm here, and I'm trying to get the hell out of here. Come now, 2012. Ask a person in any job situation, a situation where they go, you're going to be three types of people. One. Why do you work for FedEx? What do you mean why I work for FedEx? I got a job. Why do you work for FedEx? Well, you know, it is hard hours, man. It's long. I've been driving this truck. It's crazy, but it's the best I can do right now, and I get a good check. Last person, why do you work at FedEx? I don't work here. I'm really an MC. I'm waiting for my opportunity to record my album. I'm only doing this right now so I can eat. Yo, really? My name is da 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 I'm trying to get free. The colors have... They're not lost. They're hidden. Lost you may never find. Hidden, you just gotta look for. Know your purpose. You have a purpose. Everything alive in nature, even inanimate objects, have purpose. You have a purpose. Know your purpose. If you don't know your purpose, link up with someone who knows their purpose. Chances are when you link up with someone who knows their purpose, you find yours. A major solution to countering the war on melanated people is to read, to do what was illegal for your ancestors to do during the period of enslavement. It's no accident that laws were passed preventing African people from reading or writing. If you can't tell where you came from, you can't pass on that knowledge to your descendants. There are many retired teachers, old school teachers in the 60s and 70s that remember the old system of teaching. Remember how it was, A, B, C's first, your dynamics of mathematics, what it is. Those old school teachers are sitting there with nothing to do. They're just getting a pension and they're rotting away. Get together in your community. Get a home, rent a, a building or whatever, and use her, who has the credentials of a teacher, and the homeschooling credentials together, and teach your own children. Create your own curricula. 
teach them, of course, to keep up in the outer world as far as competition is concerned and what to do, that, but teach your own children because the psychological dynamic of your own being taught by you is enormous, has ramifications way down the line when they go out into the other world. Travel is very important. Uh, in terms of real education, to be somewhere uh, in, in that instance, to actually go somewhere uh, and be in that place definitely sheds mo a lot of knowledge on things that are hidden in one society and is beaming like sunlight in another one. What I've learned in traveling to Africa, specifically in South Africa, I had assumed uh, as, as I got involved in the African Senate movement in the late 80s, and learning all of these wonderful stories about ancient African history and culture. I assumed the continental Africans knew that history. But when I went to South Africa and, and started talking about Kimit, they had no idea. And why was that? Because they were socialized. We hear about the Asian scramble for Africa. We hear about the East Indian scramble, the European scramble for Africa. There should be an African-American scramble for Africa. We should be going into Africa with our, with our finances organized and saying, guess what? We're going to invest in this oil. Here's $5 million up front, okay? Show us a budget on paper. What do you need for the refineries? Okay, what are they going to cost? Where are you going to purchase them from? We're going to invest in that. Uh, we're going to invest in the diamonds. Enough of the Beers and Oppenheimer, okay? We're going to sell our own diamonds. Isn't it amazing? that 90% of the world's diamonds comes out of the ground of Africa and there's not a black man on earth who sells diamonds anywhere? The Nayan chiefs came together in ceremonies with African Americans. I was there, I saw it with my own eyes. And they apologized for their ancestors selling us into enslavement. They apologized and they opened the door for African Americans to come back to Ghana. And the Ghanaian government passed legislation giving land and citizenship to any African American who wanted to come back to Ghana. And, and hundreds, if not thousands, have taken them up on that offer. During the administration of uh, Jimmy Carter, the big new Brzezinski wrote a white paper that was sent to all State Department agency that everything in their power had to be done to keep African Americans and Africans from uniting politically culturally or economically. Sisters and brothers on the continent are told, don't mess with those African Americans. They do drugs, they're violence, they don't respect themselves, they don't respect their women. And I've been told by people who come here as students and what have you, that their parents are warned, tell their children, don't mess around with those African Americans, bad things will happen to you. So there's a deliberate lack of um, connectedness. And I think that the powers that be understand the potential of the link up between Africans in the diaspora and Africans at home. I deal a lot with African brothers and sisters who come here all the time. Some of them who have temporary visas, school visas, working visas, and some who have actually become citizens. And I know for a fact that when they come here and come through customs, they are given an orientation into living in America. And one of the things that they are specifically told to do is stay away from African Americans. They're not good people to hang around. In fact, I've even heard that there is a video shown a propaganda video that is shown to African immigrants kind of highlighting some of the negative things that African Americans participate in and how they should stay away from us. So without a doubt, that threat of a pan-African unification is something that, you know, the global powers of the world is very concerned about, especially with the intermingling of black folk from all over the world. And that's why when you come across a lot of Africans, they're afraid to interact with you because they've been told by the government that allowed them to be here in the first place that we don't want to see you around them. And that's why you tend not to see their participation in our political organizations because many of them are not citizens. So they can be deported at a second's notice. And as we know, because of racism, an African is more likely to be deported than anybody else for subversive activity. That doesn't mean we can't work with them. How do you fix it? You have to govern yourself. Nation building begins with governing your family. Black men, stay home. You don't have to be at the bar every week. You ain't got to be out with the buddies. Tend to your wife and your children. Make them the priority in your life and govern your family. Link with other men that are governing their families. Too many times, 
black men that are good with their families link up with other black men that corrupt them and destroy the family. The only way a nation can be built is if the family is intact. A nation is a bunch of united families. That's what a nation is. Once you build those things, learn how to start practicing group economics. Group economics means that every nickel, every dollar, penny comes in your hands, makes sure it revolves around and goes to other black folks' hands at least eight to 12 times before it leaves. That means if you've got a black community, a dollar comes in, you go down to the black grocery store and buy your black groceries. The black grocery store owner, he goes over to the black barber and gets his hair cut from a black barber. The black barber then goes down and buys his car from a black automobile dealership. The black automobile dealership then goes right in the black cab. And you know what I'm saying? The black community doesn't need any new leaders. Black people just have to get on the same page with one another and black people will be all right. The thing is, there's no gay leader. The gay community just happens to be on the same page with one another and they know how to get their needs met. There's no Jewish leader. There's no white leader. White people, Jewish people, all of these groups, they just happen to be on the same page and this is where their strength comes from and they know how to get their needs met. The thing is, black people, we're too divisive among each other. So we have to get on the same page and that will alleviate many of our problems right there. Go back to all those black and white films where you saw the Klan marching on Washington. Thousands of white men in hooded robes marching. Where are all those robes today? So they burned them all. This is what baffles me about American society. Who cleans these robes? This is, these robes are not machine washable. They got patches and stuff on them. You gotta take it to the cleaners. Who's, who's upgrading and mending, sewing, and keeping all those robes in material existence to this day? Who's doing that work? <laughs> who's doing, where the robes go? Why you can't get one on auction? Why you don't see one at the Salvation Army? Thrift shop, clan robe at the thrift shop. Somebody turned it in. Why you don't see that? Because people are still holding on to them. They even still wearing them. Maybe not outside, but somewhere it's still getting worn. Now I could tell you where all the Black Panther outfits are. They got holes in them <laughs> with red liquid all over them. I can tell you where the guns went. The cops took them after they shot this guy. In the, come on. Fred Hampton, I can tell you where his guns went. We know what happened to our movements. What happened to the other one? I would say that what you do for yourself depends on what you think of yourself. And what you think of yourself depends on what you know of yourself. And what you know of yourself depends on what you have been told. Never allow anybody to tell you that history and culture is not important. Never let anybody say that happened a long time ago, get over it. Make your history sacred. Malcolm X used to say, of all our studies, it is history that is most qualified to reward our research. Believe that what you do makes a difference in the world, that we do not have to be passive victims, that you can blame other people for your victimization before your rehabilitation, your salvation, your liberation. That's your responsibility. We're supposed to be controlling like black hair. We're the only people who got a certain texture of hair, thickness in hair. It calls curly or kinky, whatever you want to call it. Why is it the Koreans are controlling black hair care at 85 cents out of, uh, out of every dollar goes to Asians and Koreans? Why are Koreans and Chinese controlling black hair care and black hair care products? Because you're not practicing group economics. But I go to a Chinese place and I ask them to buy something from black folk, they won't do it. Some black distributors came right here to Washington DC, the H Street right over here, and said, uh, we'd like to meet with some merchants, sell you some products. And uh, and the agent said, what do you want to sell? He said, we'll sell you some of the same products you got on your shelf right now. We'll sell it to you and give you a 25 to 30% discount. The agent said, we're not interested. The agent said, but, but with a 25 to 30% discount, you're still not interested? They said, no. They said, why not? The agent said, you black folks don't understand. It ain't the money. It's that we only buy from our own people. You blacks are the only people that buy from in and everybody. School books, textbooks. 
We need to put pressure on the schools so that this information is brought in. Put pressure on the, on the, um, on the pastor so that you have a Sunday school class that teaches about the black presence in the Bible. All kinds of basic things that we can do. I don't think it's rocket science. I think it's just a matter of us sitting down and strategizing and then implementing those strategies. The thing is you can alter nature temporarily. If you tame an animal, you can tame a wild animal to do circus tricks, but after a while that animal is gonna turn on you and go back to his original nature. You can travel around the world and you see societies that are engulfed in trees, vines. Nature has engulfed certain vast civilizations. Certain civilizations are covered in sand. Nature has taken back over. Certain civilizations are immersed underwater. Nature has taken back over. So again, you can alter nature temporarily, but nature will always triumph. Nature will always win. Melanin is nature. Civil rights is a waste of time. Because you're not, because again, you're using a very broad term. When I, if you see these women groups out here, what are they doing? They're looking for women's rights. What are you looking for? They're looking for veteran rights. What are you looking for? I'm looking for Indian rights. What are you looking for? I'm looking for Hispanic rights. What are you looking for? I'm looking for Arab rights. What are you looking for? I'm looking for gay rights. Until you get the black folk. You're not looking for, they, they're looking for civil rights. Who in the world is civil? You know, there's a lot of shame um, that has, you know, washed over uh, poor black communities in particular, a lot of shaming and blaming, and we've got to end that and come together as a community and say we are committed to ending this system once and for all and open our hearts um, to, to young men returning home from prison uh, rather than just wa wagging a finger at them and, you know, saying, why can't you do better? Um, there's a lot of reasons why folks aren't able to do better than they are today. Do not think about racism in the term of hating anybody. Don't hate any whites, don't hate any Asians, don't hate any Arabs, don't hate anybody. It ain't about hating anybody. But neither is it about loving anybody. It's about learning how to compete economically as a group. I have visited high schools and colleges and elementary schools where the predominant children are, are of European descent. And at the end of my presentation, they're hurt. Because they say, I don't have any problem identifying with Africa. If that's where I came from, that's where I came from. As you get older, and I've noticed it's right at the end of college going into post-college, that you have to buy into the untruth because that's the very essence of your being now. And much of what you get, whether it be a job or whether it be an advantage, comes from uh, what's called white privilege. And out of this white privilege comes the ability to get things that you want. You want to feed your family. You want to take care of things. You want a job but you want it fairly. You don't want it unfairly. You don't want to think that a whole group of people have been shunned out of a position because your skin color gave it to you. As you get older, it's hard to give that up, that privilege. We begin to understand this is about behavior and our behavior towards nature. Black people just incidentally happen to be an object in nature it is those who have behaved inappropriately or most whites don't behave inappropriately most whites are actually as victimized as most people of color where the confusion is because of the whiteness of skin most whites think they will have an opportunity to ascend to the position of power of those who are doing the oppressing and that's where their confusion comes in Meanwhile, they suffer and tolerate that suffering, whereas others may resist it because we know we can never make that ascension. Who protects the interests of this group? Who, who really protects the interests of this group? The ones who enslaved you are protecting your interests, even if they free you. That's like, that's like a rapist keeping you in prison for 10 years, raping you every day for 10 years. You insane with it. Then the 11th year, he says, I reached an epiphany, I was wrong. I shouldn't have did that. You're free to go. <laughs> now you're free to go? <laughs> go where? <laughs> free? Your whole heart is screwed up. Where you going? That same person says, 
Uh, okay, you can stay in one of my rooms called Chicago. You can stay in one of my rooms called New York. One of my rooms called Philly. Just follow the rules there in Philly and you'll be fine. I'm sorry for what I did. Here's reparate, no, not even reparate, here's affirmative action. Uh, here's some, some justice in the courts. Here's, here's a little money, here's a little economics. Here's a little access to something. I'll let you fight in our wars and here's a little something. But for the most part, you're on your own now. Do, do you? Now here we are. Crazy, deranged, <laughs> walking around, being raped for 300 years. Now you're free. And your head is going, woo! But here's the point. You were God to begin with. <laughs> this is what we forgot. This is what we forgot. You were God to begin with. So you did get beat, raped, punched, lynched, burned. But what happened? You're still here. And what is still here? Not the bodies that were burned, not the hangings, the innocent victims, but the spirit that created those people, the, the force that animates us, never die.